Hello and welcome back to World War II TV and a continuation of our Armoured Actions Week. And we have Jonathan Ware with us, who was with, on us, with us not that long ago, talking about the British uh, in the Ardennes. And now he's back to talk about British steel in Normandy. And the interesting thing about this one, although I've just seen uh, Jonathan's slides, I don't quite know where we're going with this one, which is kind of cool because uh, John knows his stuff. Uh, those of you watching, you know your stuff. So we're going di to dive straight in and talk about British armor in Normandy and hopefully explode out of the water or out of those wheat fields some of the myths that have established over the years about British armor. And feel free to jump in with your comments. I know there's people watching like Niels and Brad who know their stuff and we'll have a good chat. So without further ado, I'll introduce Jonathan. So good evening, Jonathan. How are you today? Right, breezy. I've got model tanks out. It's great. Cool. I mean, yeah, I'm behaving. Model tanks. So, model tanks. Um, you know, before we start with this, I mean, British armour in Normandy is one of the most written about aspects and everybody's had a go at it over the last 70 years and, and all variations of the... Um, Generally, in 30 years ago, we were crap and the, uh, you know, the Allies were crap and the Germans are good. Now things are changing a little bit, but still often not as much primary research as should be used. It's often just a veteran told me this and I heard this. So before we get into the presentation, just how difficult is it as a researcher to kind of find the truth through this um, this um, labyrinth of, of myth and misinformation? I'm going to throw something straight at you. David Render's memoirs. They don't make sense. Now, Stuart Tootle, I think you did the edit on that. Uh, I uh, I was reading Render's memoirs a while ago, and it, I couldn't work it out at all because his introduction says, I'm not going to talk about strategic affairs and how good tanks are and all that stuff. And then I think it's page four or five, he's doing the same thing. Um, so there was a lot of editing there. I, I can only imagine. The, the introduction reads differently from much of the rest of the book. It's a bit like Belton, Cooper, and Ambrose. I, uh, some things happened here. I want the original manuscript. I don't trust the printed book. And if I don't trust it, something's gone wrong along the way. Also, it's data. So each British armoured regiment or, or tank regiment is one part of a combined arms team. And this is one thing we're going to get. I'm going to upset people if you if you if you into like the British aren't progressive. This is this is quite progressive stuff. You need your RT. You need your infantry. You need your motor battalion. You need your MMGs. You need your your brigade. You also need the relevant infantry supporting. You need your, your agra. You need your AOP. And I can go on this list for a long time. But you're looking at massive sources just for the British side or Canadian side. Um yeah. And uh, th I mean, there's a new book coming out in second five and four parts, and I I'm not sure it's going to do the job because it's focusing on one armoured regiment. And the chap's last book was, again, I, I was flicking through it the other day, uh, mostly using sources solely relating to one artillery regiment. It's too narrow. For me, it's too narrow. It's not good enough. We can do a lot better. Let's do better together. Yeah, well... You're in luck. Because Someone may be upset today, but you know. <laughs> the recurring theme this week, talking to Daniel Bolger, the retired Lieutenant General and Pritt and everybody else, has been that studying armour without looking at combined arms is is ultimately going to not give you the correct answers. The, the use of armour it has always been as part of a greater organization. So in order to understand you, as you say, you have to look at artillery and logistics and, and you know, infantry and all those other aspects. So there we go. So um, we, we'll bring up your PowerPoint up on screen and I'm going to hand over to you and folks, please jump in with questions. I will be jumping in with questions and um, there we go. So uh, British Steel in Normandy. I'm very excited to hear Jonathan Ware's um, interpretation and explanations tonight. So this stems from an idea I had several years ago. I um, I said to someone, actually a few people at Tank Museum who may hear this eventually, I said to their faces, hey, let's do a British Steel event with the old British Steel logo. Get that out. And let's look at British tanks bang up front and centre, because you do German stuff. What, what, why not? And the answer given was, you know, Tiger brings in 10 times, 15 times the amount of any equivalent tank. No one cares about Brit stuff. And I was like, you've got to stimulate the market. So this is me throwing that branding forward and going, Bobby, let's do something. Let's do something cool together, because there's some great specialists, and most of us are edgy, like Robert Glennie and so. They, we've got teams in the UK and abroad who can deliver on this really well, and it would be popular. So... Uh, the pictures I've included in front of you, you've obviously got, um, I think it's 7RTR during Epsom at the top with one of their ch uh, Churchill 6s. We'll get back to the 75mm gunning on that. Uh, we've also at the bottom left got a uh, Mark 1 Crusader AA next to a Sherman DD, uh, a 
a relate relative of mine was um in 79th armored um and spoke about them being dinky doos more than ducks D dinky doos and donald ducks yeah and then the bottom right you've got um i think it's the royal dragoon um guards or something advancing in normandy but i want to sort of a, a bit of a bit of a, a mishmash the key cut hut here if you're watching it you're going to see lots of churchill action i'm a huge churchill fan i want my own churchill i want my own troop as a living memorial to uh the royal armored corps but we'll come back to that one day that's 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 a, that's, that's a, a later thing well we're, but, we're all churchill yeah. fans if we're not and we're talking about the tank more than the prime minister but we, yeah anyone who's not a churchill fan if they like if they pretend they understand armor has not understood armor i yeah, would venture yeah. to say yeah and so so in this i wanted to look at like in normandy we use a lot of kit and i mean I, i'm still we're going to come to conga briefly but Conga's in Normandy. It's never properly used. It turns up in once or twice and then backs off and is hidden in a shed corner by the guys using it. So there's all this specialist kit. We have stewards. No one talks about stewards. What aren't we talking about when we're looking at armor? And there's so many assumptions. And I always go on about feedback loops, how historians quote each other and stuff. I could be an absolute twazzock and grab books and hold them up. There's no point to it. One of the problems with British armor is we trust our other people's work and we quote it and quote it and quote it. We shouldn't do that. So what we're going to do first off, just double checking my slides in the order, is we're going to look at the first slide, which covers like doctrine and all this sort of stuff. So this will cover some people you may or may not be aware of. Uh, in the bottom, in the middle, is uh, Gen Major General Ricky Richards, uh, George Ricky Richards. Um, Ricky Richards is a curious character. He's Major General 21st Army Group. He is important in this story and everyone overlooks him, but his, I would say his records are IWM because I've gone through them and he crops up in other accounts and they they offer us, they offer an angle of British armor we, we don't normally consider. You've got Monty. Monty's very important. Harold Pyman's very important as well. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is going to be focusing on independent tank and armor brigades. Yes, there will be a cut and thrust, mostly 34 tank and a fourth armored brigade, but I want to look at this as a lens. So what basically happens is 21st Army Group has a problem in June 44, which is we have these wonderful things called independent tank brigades, and we also have independent armoured brigades, which were all meant to be equipped with Churchill tanks, and we don't have enough. So, oh, bugger, we, what are we going to do? We, we've got to need a solution. So the logic is we're just going to use the Shermans as Churchill tanks. Now, now, there's a little problem with this, which is they weigh the same. And they carry similar guns, but the front armor is a little bit different. Uh, their ability to traverse terrain is a little different. And the driving skills are not taking now. That. That's I don't care who that is. Um, the driving skills. Is someone saying you on telly? I, I, I know. I think that's someone telling me I'm wrong already, and being like this was a great plan, or that Monty was right, or Pyman was wrong. Either way, either way. So. Um, there's not enough Churchills. So the logic is we're just going to use Shermans as our independent armoured brigades, and they're going to use them in the same role. Now, both vehicles have comparable cross-country speeds. They actually do. I mean, almost all combat in Normandy, cross-country, happens about 12 miles an hour, but Panther and Cromwell, sorry, I've sworn at everyone, but if you, if you, th if you think there's more tanks moving more than 12 miles an hour cross-country, you're bonkers. You don't understand armoured warfare. Let's throw that out straight off. So, oh, someone's really dedicated. Someone else is going to pick that up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I love I love live shows. It's great, isn't it? Like <laughs> this is this is exactly what I didn't want to have them. Hold on, I'm gonna answer it. Should I? Uh, uh. Hello, I'm busy right now and on the internet. Can you go away? Bye bye. Don't call the landline again. Bye. Love you. Bye. That was my sister. She 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 must be trolling me, and I bet she's gonna call back as well. So yeah, say hi to my sister in chat. She'll appreciate it. Say hi, Philly. So. Um, we've we've got this problem where we want to use Shermans as Churchill tanks, and they've got the same gun and stuff, but all armoured combat, if you look at it, they're all moving 12 miles an hour max across country. Uh, so Churchill and Tiger are actually advancing at the same rate. The road speeds and stuff, this is irrelevant when we're talking about combat. So we'll come back, we'll come back to that slightly. So you've got 76 millimeter frontal armor on a Sherman versus 90 to 150 millimeter of frontal armor on a uh, Churchill. So what is recognized pretty quickly by people like Harold Priman is this is not really a good idea because your Churchill is a lot lighter than your, uh, sorry, your Sherman is a lot lighter than your Churchill. How are you going to use the two? So Priman advocates separate doctrine. He had commanded three royal tanks in North Africa, and this is someone who does know armor very well. He has a good amount of operational experience. And he says they should hang back and they should shoot in the infantry. So basically we've now got sort of mobile 
mobile indirect art, art, artillery sort of employment of tanks. Um, the problem is Montgomery wants something different. Monty wants a single doctrine because he believes in the capital tank. Well, now, we're looking forward to Centurion already. That's that's in Monty's mind. He's fed up of all these different types of tanks, doing all these different sort of things. He wants a capital tank to take the fight to the enemy. So he thinks, no, nah, we're not going to have doctrinal distinction between this independent armoured and, uh, and tank brigades. Um, so with, what we'll do is we're going to have radically different formations, light and infantry slash heavy, and they're going to fight the same way. This is this is going to be fine. This this won't be a problem. So this sounds stupid, apart from it actually makes quite a lot of sense. And I think I think a lot of the operational studies we really need now. This is always what I come back to. I don't think a lot of them are, are there or done to a, a good enough level. We'll look at that in a bit. So I think there's an unspoken belief in 21st Army Group. But remember, Monty and Co. They're all paperless. They're really progressive. It's all team based. All work work meetings. Um, and lots of people say Monty's an authoritarian. Uh, I'm not so sold on this when you look at people he's working with and what they're saying post-war and at the time and what Ricky Richards says. And we're coming back to Richards in a second. So there's an unspoken belief that unified doctrine offers greater success than two separate doctrines for units that are going to move about anyway. Now, we often slap the Brits for at moving their tanks from different divisions and corps and stuff, the tank brigades. But the Germans do the same thing with their Sturmgeschutz Brigade. They train them with X, they deploy them with Y, and then they move them. Uh, everyone's doing this. Now, there was the mixed division experiment, uh, which was uh, ultimately a failure. It, it made it, it was two infantry brigades was too small, plus an armoured brigade, maybe three. But then they were big, pretty big. And we'd already slimmed down the infantry divisions in 1938 and stuff to try and make them more mobile. The British Army is meant to be an agile force. This is a progressive modern military. We don't want, if you look at the modern British Army force organisations, they are very clunky things for divisions. These are clunky bulk, that's nowadays. I think a Second World War commander would be raising an eyebrow at them. Um, so any current officers, have a look at them and compare them to Second World War ones. Go, mm, divisional slice, I need a little look at that. So what he also has a problem, which is the British Army has all developed in somewhat of an organic way. Now, people will disagree with this, but this is what's happening. You have divisions and uh, different divisions are not functioning the same way. We're not looking like uh, you know how the Germans are doing stuff really unified. We have quite a lot of innovation and organic growth happening, and different brigades function differently in the same divisions. So instead of having two separate doctrines of which for units which are going to move about anyway, potentially attached to a division for three or four days with commanders who have bigger things to worry about, why don't we have one way to use everything? And that's probably where it comes from. It's simplicity. Keep it simple, stupid. We know 21st Army Group is a very modern, technically advanced organisation, and they don't want all this levels of faff. And that's where Ricky Richards comes in. So Ricky Richard is Monty's go-to bloke, and I can't stress this enough. Monty goes to Ricky Richards on everything. Ricky Richards, when Monty's answers are being read in the commons, it's not Monty's voice. Ricky, Monty is signing off on Richard's words. So Richard, uh, Ricky Richards, as Major General 21st Army Group, is massively influential in a way that we really do overlook. Um, and Monty, uh, Monty defers to him So when it comes to armoured stuff. So I don't think this is Monty talking. I think this is Monty deferring to Richards and a group of Royal Armoured Corps officers going, oh, in practice, this is going to be a bit of a pain. And again, you'll get snippets of this through the source material. So I'd love to someone to prove me wrong. It'll take you a few years probably, but you know, I'd be really keen to, to this because it says a lot about how militaries learn, how they're adapting and implementing. Well, well, just briefly, John, I mean, it, this, this whole idea of Monty being at the center of everything, that's often post-war re revisionism anyway. And when we talk about something like Operation Goodwood, we attribute things that Dempsey said to Montgomery. And I say we, historians, particularly on the other side of the Atlantic, it's always Monty, Monty, Monty. And what you made the good point that Monty has a team around him, and but in, in the conventional narrative, it seems as if everything is coming from Monty. And it's good that someone like Richards is being mentioned because these are figures that should be put back into the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, but uh, Dempsey is a re Dempsey actually doesn't feature into what I'm going to talk about so much today, actually. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a team. And we all lose sight of that. Oddly enough, I don't have to pick this up recently. I've not gone through it yet. Um, but there is a lot more work being done more generally on these wider groupings over the last, like, it takes, what, five, ten years to research something like that. So, yeah. Um, but there is a lot more work happening. So we basically decided to adopt this approach. 
uh, where they're going to all be used the same. But it's also underpinned by combined arms tactics. And also, pretty much from the get-go, even then we're using these formations differently, you know, brigades differently. So it doesn't even survive sort of first contact with the enemy. And I'm, I'm not sure always why people say it, it doesn't happen. Anyway, so here we go on to the next slide. Which is so we're going to look at we're going to look at Churchill doctrine, tank doctrine. Um, so the key emphasis here is basically on infantry to capture ground quickly. So tanks can engage infantry, and infantry can engage tanks. Now, of course, the infantry are going to have their six pounders and piots and stuff. Which, I mean, this sounds pretty bold. Like infantry charging down tanks. It sounds pretty bold. And the tanks will be present to subdue any automatic weapon which may be preventing the infantry achieving the target. So yeah, automatic weapons are going to cause problems, so your tanks are going to be knocking them out. Now, people listening to this are probably going, well, the enemy are probably not going to let you passively knock out their machine guns. They're going to have anti-tank guns, they're going to have mortars, they're going to have artillery, they're going to have all this kit and tanks. This is going to be crazy. How's this going to work? So... Basically, the RT is meant to whack out all the anti-tank guns, which are meant to be located by the Recce Troop, who, Stuart lovers, this is coming, we're coming back to the Recce Troop, and I've got a lot of soft spot for the Recce Troops, because they're, they're, they're really, actually, to be honest, they're so important, That's I could waste hours on Recce Troops in Normandy. But you need to locate the anti-tank guns first, those need to be taken out by RT, that is absolutely pivotal to Doctrine. The Recce Troop is so, so important, and we never talk about them, really. Um, there's some cool stuff like um, John Spencer, Dan's dad, does some really cool stuff in towards valets. Well, I mean, genuinely really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, as a whole, we sort of lose sight of them because they're Stuart tanks. What the, what are Stuart tanks doing in Normandy? I know the Americans have them, but still, what they're dinky little things. Um, so some logic of this about stems from that a commander has very little in, in, in information coming into him. Uh, tank commander will be buttoned down in his tank, probably headset us on, death to the world. Uh, he can unbutton and he'll be far more aware. I know you've all heard this before. He'll be far more aware, but this increases risk of being becoming casualty to mortar. Actually, mortars cause a lot of casualties. To them. Infantry can talk to the tanks via telephones, the 38 sets, or banging with their rifles and guns on the hull to get noticed. But of course, the 35-ton tank suddenly having something whiz at it will care little for a little squidgy infantryman weighing about 70 kilograms. So these are not really the best way forward. We're also going to look at 38 sets because everyone knows I love bashing on the 38 set, but um, that becomes a lot more relevant. So the doctrine really is for the tanks to engage infantry, your enemy anti-tank guns will be neutralized or suppressed by artillery or destroyed. And uh, then your infantry can make gains by being very aggressive. Oh my word, the British army being aggressive. Who would think this is this is army doctrine? Monty's conservative. What? This is nonsense. Why is this man on the internet talking to us? But this is how the British army doctrine is working. This is how the British army are intending to fight. This is how they are fighting. Um, it may not I, and just just to interrupt for, for those um who are following along this is this worldwide this doctrine is this specifically modified for the eto if it's for the eto have they drawn from experiences in north africa and the med is it how, how universal is this doctrine oh uh italy's not really my uh, jam i mean quite a lot of stuff has come over from italy uh because before normandy they're getting the daily insoms and stuff a lot of north african veterans have arrived in formations uh to bolster them we don't talk about it ncos and things uh and you've also got obviously monty's uh main command staff he's brought a lot of people over as well um i'm not sure how they're doing it in the far east that's not really my jam uh that's that's a completely i mean that's chalk and cheese you know like in terms of yeah the to, to me it seems that the eto this the normandy and then through Northwest Europe is, is is not separate from, but they're all developing in, in individually, really, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and home forces have had years to perfect this. So when Monty comes back, he's taking over uh, the second army and everything, which is basically sat at home, bar a few units like 7th Armoured, uh, for the best part of, what, four or five years? Many of them, a lot of them have. Um, and they're now going to get flung into a, a, a modern warfare, a modern... Uh, war using the latest kit which they've been trialing perfecting they've got rid of portis portis are useless and they've developed on a different path there is a different development path that happens in the uk um and there's different constraints to training and all this sort of stuff going on um so yeah i, I only ever comment on what i know and if i don't know I, I always just yield the ground because too many historians do and if you do you're bad you're naughty stop being naughty um so the next one 
is this is where we look at the wreckage troop. Now, I know some of these pictures, one or two of them are of Americans and some of them are from the desert. But in Normandy, wreckage troops, they have such a mishmash of kit. Some of them have like really like shacked out stewards, which must have been falling apart. And if you read the accounts, you're like, this, like some of them are like four or five marks of Stuart in the same wreckage troop of 11 tanks. But they're integral. And this is where we come back to their, the eyes and ears. So the wreckage troops in armoured, independent armoured, uh, regiments and independent tank regiments and also in your armoured divisions. They fulfil the same role. They are your eyes and ears for your regiment. Uh, they replace you. So this is, we're coming back, I'm going to go back slightly. So in January 1944, uh, they introduced the stewards and these replace universal carriers. The logic seems we want our wreckage troops to be more protected, but this obviously means they have a higher profile and they've got a large vehicle and now it has a gun on it and that gun may attract some interest. Uh, the structure is 11 tanks. There's There are varying structures, but it's usually three headquarters tanks and four sections, note the word section, of two stewards. Um, the, in HQ, you've got the commander, two IC, and the, the third tank is um, uh, third tank is a liaison vehicle or a backup one in the event something goes pop. Um, and the, all these these Rekke troops can be easily netted in, so they're meant to be able to net it into individual squad squadrons or into the regiment or also operates as their own small armored squadron which does happen towards valets we do have some of these units operating basically independently as our light armored squadrons running about the countryside no one talks about it but it is happening and germans are being captured and shot up occasionally by them and they're quite a useful additional asset their core role is locating those anti-tank guns and uh the, the quote well some some of the doctrine underpinning them and what is said to the crews is really clear and it's to see without being seen aiming to emulate the standard of armored car regiments in the western desert always dead accurate in every detail that should be the standard of all recce troops so we, we sort of got like a sub elite um some units say they were more bolshy characters put into them uh, in italy i think that quote cro crops up a bit because it's quite dangerous work at times but Accurate enemy AFV identification is essential, and it's key, key they re rapidly relay targets to their supporting forward observation officers, allowing artillery to get on target quickly and eliminate those guns. But there's a stark warning as well, and this stark warning is pretty, like if you look at some of the tank, the tank brigade and regiment stuff, this is really stark where the sort of poke of authority lies. If tank squadrons are caught by close range fire, the anti the recce troop, sorry, if the tank squadrons are caught by close range anti-tank fire, the recce troop has failed in its task. So if your Shermans and your uh, Churchills are getting knocked out, it's these guys' problem. You blame your recce troop. Uh, during Operation Green Line, 107 Royal Armoured Corps actually loses their entire recce corps to enemy heavy artillery uh, re recce troop um, uh, before they even see action. All the turrets get stoved and the guns get smashed. They all get jalopied almost immediately. But then you do see pictures of some of the other ones do get the turrets back on later on. So the key thing is there to locate enemy guns uh, quickly and efficiently and, you know, relay the data back so they're knocked out. This is also why it's controversial. Some of the crews did clearly think that universal carriers were better fit suited to this role because they're low profile, they're small, they're discreet. You can stand next to one and you'll be taller than a universal carrier. I mean, like, you know, like here's a is a model of one for anyone. Oh, there you go. For anyone particularly keen. Uh they're diddly little things, you know. I know it's low quality, but there's the internet for you. Um, so these were seen as preferential by some of the Rico troops when they got the stewards, because they're like, why are we getting guns? Um, but when they do operate towards um Falais around Thury Hardcore and stuff, uh 34 tank brigade do get issue of canister rounds. Uh, beehive canister rounds and again something you more associate with the americans so they're blatting off giant shotgun rounds at any irritating points of resistance like, this is not something that normally makes 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 the uh, makes sort of the news on this stuff and one thing which is interesting is these units rapidly evolve british armor in normandy is a rapid evolution um and uh yeah uh, i can't stress that enough uh um and actually we're going to come to some of the weird stuff like that because the next one is myths. It's not all myths. Some of this just fun things. Some of this is fun things I'm throwing in. Um, because, you know, I mean, we've got to have some fun. So, yeah, so the topic's feedback loop. So we repeat stuff ad finatum. One of the first things I noticed about this topic when I was much younger was how loads of reenactors all, all wore tank crew oversuits. And they called them teddy bears. They called them pixie suits. 
And they'd be like, oh, I've got my pixie suit. It cost me 50 quid. Now they're like 500. They're not worth 500. Actually, I'm, people have just hoarded them. That's all that's happened. Um, and I was thinking, oh, that's weird. And eventually it turned out there's a single IWM item attributed to 141 Royal Armoured Corps, the buffs with their crocs, and it's an oversuit. And they're like, they were used in Normandy. So I, after a long period of time, I tracked down the issue records for this. And it turns out they were issued after Normandy. But if you look at the photographic record of Normandy, you'll note one unit wears loads of them. And that's First Polish Armoured Division, who enter late. But we know that lots of equipment trials are on theatre. Uh, there's some, uh, I've been told the sniper trials, but never seen the documents. And Mason still hasn't sent them over. Um, and we've got like ground trailing aerial crafts. There's so much kit being tested in theater. I mean, the Valentine 17 pounder SP enters uh, two of those, but there's all this stuff being tested, trialed, information sent back to the UK, entrenching tools. They're getting, they're being viewed as better as, you know, mine prods. So they're being sent back, retrofitted with the bayonet attachment shoved on and deployed. So that, that vehicles and mods are happening. It, it should not be surprising. This should be the norm. Uh, I mean, Churchill's get their ARB cupolas. They were starting to put them on before the campaign. This is a later point, but throw in now. Uh, but throughout the campaign and afterwards, you see more and more ARVs till the end of what every Churchill's got an ARV cupola all around vision. So, again, just progressive model. Just, again, sorry to be, to be basic about this, John, but some of the um, historians who talk about the British never learning and being stubborn, the, the rapid changes and introductions of kit and modifications of kits. I mean, it's happening on a weekly, almost daily basis within individual, you know, regiments. I mean, you, you know, you pick up any book. I mean, I haven't got all the regimental histories, but the ones I've got, Essex Regiment, Royal Oster Rifles, various others, they're improvising very, very quickly how to do things better than you were the week before. So this, this idea that we're stuck with about the British being this rather blunt instrument that just goes about repeating everything the same way until it works is is really about time it died frankly yeah there's there's some some of it you can trace certain attacks to where key people become casualties i'm pretty sure actually uh i've got a project i'm not going to say which one it is uh for the future um which people criticize but if you look at it there's been enough seeing casualties of senior personnel that you can see why people would fall back on their crutch um rather than try something new and that exacerbates casualties uh but yeah british army i mean the 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 cycles you can track down to 24 hours or 48 hours at times. There's rapid innovation, creation of union units, all this sort of stuff. Uh, that like, counterwater organizations, they're a fantastic topic, amazing data out there. Someone can do a dissertation on that one. Uh, and how re modern militaries can learn from this stuff. Modern militaries, you can learn so much from the British Army in World War II. Seriously, it's a great topic. Um, and there's brilliant people who do the topic who you don't tend to hear from. Um, so yeah, um, when it comes to feedback loops, one of the most irritating ones was the whole, how does a Churchill catch that tiger? So a mate of mine called me up um, uh, after hearing my We Have Ways thing, because he went out and bought, uh, uh, who was it? Max Hastings uh, audiobook. And it quotes a story of a, a subaltern turning up at a unit and be like, oh, so... Um, what how does how does someone get a panther and he hears the tail and then he hears that how does has anyone caught a tiger no and it's told you know deadpan oh it's a very serious real story uh he said this is bollocks he said because i checked you know your reference out and found out that it's a joke and it was a popular joke among tankies in normandy as andrew wilson in his memoir used the word a catechism and it took me actually a few years to trace that one when i was much younger back all this way for this and that was that's been cycled hundreds of times that it's a true story some people even give the units now i mean people have actively created a whole story now around this it's, it's nonsense it was a popular joke how to catch a tiger it's just a joke and it's a good one it's a really good one um but that became fact um, and then we've got other ones. I mean, Churchill, Cro Churchill tanks. So let's look at crocodiles. Let's talk about crocodile executions. How many crocodile crews were executed? What, it's four or five? Um, there's that weaponology uh, program. Uh, I think it was weaponology or tank, killer tanks or something. It aired on uh, History TV in the 2000s, and it's total nonsense. There was one incident where it happened, and one of the crew members survived. Hence, we know it happened. That's yeah. a key point. And so why does it happen more often? Oh, well, you, anyone would execute a flamethrower crewman. Yeah, possibly. The problem is if you want to ex execute a crocodile crew, they're backed up usually by a tank squadron or tank regiment per troop. They're closely supported by British infantry. They have mortars and arty covering them. To get to those highly valuable crew, you've got to get through all that. That's hard. And you have to really luck out to be captured like that crew did. So, yeah, it's, it's nonsense. It's a complete factoid myth. Um, I don't mind if someone can find me more evidence on it. 
great, but it, it, it's utter nonsense. And that was stemmed from documentaries and people going, oh, you would just execute flamethrower crews out of hand. Well, all right, cool, cool logic, Bucky, but there's no evidence for this. I well, mean, we had we that discussion, evidence. didn't I? Don't forget it was about this idea, and I don't know where I got this in my head from, but it was something that I heard is that a lot of the crocodile flame, uh, <laughs> crews were, were, were Jewish you know, Eastern European Jews in the British Army. That's something I know I've read. I know I've seen people talk about it. I've seen it in things. And now I don't know where it came from and I can't find any evidence for it. And, and I guess neither can you, but it's one of those things that does the rounds. Yeah, uh, someone's thrown that at me a few months ago. I had a look at it, couldn't find anything. Um, I mean, it's possible. I find it unlikely. Um, we see, I mean, the gravestone, it should be, this isn't some, uh, the, the British Army tends to be bad at cover-ups. Uh, to be blunt on this sort of stuff, um, it strikes me as a really weird thing. Um, uh, although it could try, it could tie into some reprisal stuff, um, like a, a, a fantasy elements we do see um, and narratives building. Uh, it's sort of like um, uh, what's it called? Oh, that film. Anyway, uh, the one Tarantino did uh, with the Nazi stuff, being like a sort Inglourious of like, Bastards. Yeah, yeah. Inglourious Bastards. Imagining this, this, this like alternative kind of, universe kind of. Yeah, idea. and and pushing this myth to, to to that there was people giving it back like that. Um, I mean, actual people did. There, there's uh, that very good book about the bomber pilot and stuff and things like that. And the people in Normandy, there are German Jews in Normandy and stuff like that, fighting under aliases and all this sort of stuff is happening. But no, seemingly not one for one Royal Armoured Corps. Um, then there's the other thing, like uh, the British Army being creative. So. The British Army, the myth is the British Army never concentrate their armour, apart from like at Goodwood. But the joke is, of course, they concentrate their armour. So when they roll into Normandy, the doctrine, broadly speaking, is for one regiment support one infantry battalion. So you'd have one regiment of tanks, about 60 tanks supporting 600 men. And that actually just becomes a shooting gallery because you're dealing with such narrow confines. So they, they soon reduce this to one squadron per uh, per. per Per, well, per company or battalion is appropriate, or sometimes they will for a whole but a whole tank regiment in support of a company, but it'll be fire support. Um, on the 22nd of July, there's a big raid they do and stuff, but they and sorry, on the 21st of July, they do run Shermans all over Hill 112 uh, and Hill 113, uh, Churchill's who all over Hill 112 and Hill 113, firing smoke and shooting up the Germans and all sorts. Um, the Germans claim like 10 destroyed tanks, annoyingly, I don't have the stat penned down here. Um, but the actual British loss of like two or three vehicles tops, mostly damage. But the German the German loss rates ended up being taken by historians as accurate. And uh, Michael Reynolds, I know you looked at, I know you're dead, but I know you looked at the British sources, I know you looked at the German sources, and I know you chose the figures that you thought were most agreeable to your argument, and that's wrong. And that's the problem. We've had a lot of cherry picking on data. So for armored combat, you can sort of say whatever the hell you want. Well, the standards this, this, are so low at times. This is when, when some people, no names, thirty and forty years ago, were writing their books about armor with a preconceived notion of which way they were going to go with it, that the British were bad or the Germans were bad or that the Americans are better than the British or the Canadians were worse than... And then they, as you say, they use the evidence they find from numerous sources to support whichever case it is they want to do. And they don't, they're not looking at it objectively. And of course, it's the same as you want to say about, you know, Montgomery saying bad things about Patton or Patton saying bad things about Bradley. If you want to look for only those things, of course you can find those things. It's, 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 we need to get away from that era of people writing history with the end of the book in mind before they start the project. We want to be looking at things like Goodwood, and there's people, a history explorer, who's, who's you know studying, you know, talking about staff college, studying Goodwood, you know, wiping the slate clean and talking about it objectively and building up from what we actually know from date from sources. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think um, actually regular viewers of my stuff will know I think that a lot of these studies that are pushed in certain military academies should be thrown in the bin and started again but that that would take effort and uh, probably upset some people because they enjoyed they enjoyed those courses um uh on that point as well like uh we can talk about uh Stephen Napier so I'm not a fan of all this book on British Army in Normandy but he has an append uh, one part is all to do with British and German losses and he compares the reliance of the British casualty figures and the German figures and how they're recording armored losses um and it basically pointed out you 
it, you just can't compare them. They're two completely different systems. But again, historians do treat them as the same one because Napier did dig deeper and he, he did a, actually did a really good job on that. Um, and there's a bigger problem, which is uh, for 10th and 9th SS, we know they're recruiting vehicles. We know they're cannibalizing crews from other places and we know the replacement battalions being retrained in armor and stuff. Um, but even when you dig up those publications and things you never find out the answers and when you go to the source material i'm i, I liaise with dieter stenger and stuff uh who did the 10th ss book uh which is uh, it, it's very he it, it doesn't use enough british sources it's, it's quite a good entry into what 10th ss is doing uh the paper quality is a bit poor though uh which isn't his fault um but yeah i mean we we don't see what's happening to the uh to the crews themselves so you see a tank get knocked out i want to know what happens to the uh what happens to the crew inside uh during jameson's vc the ta the churchill uh, three whacks a tank in the face to the extent it backs off now there must be casualties in that vehicle there is no way there isn't there's quite a lot of accounts you find vehicles take serious in impacts at close range there have to be casualties we don't know what happens to them the german sources aren't there or haven't been looked at yet so or you know we haven't bothered tracking them down because you know reading german is hard lots there's i think a lot of things that are important are hard to do but we've got to do better so yeah so uh the the, the amalgamation of um british and german stats into the same area has caused a lot of damage um german losses are taken a german as i said about uh reynolds german losses are taken for granted by people like that but they can see an inflation of up to 10 times when referenced back some of the british units are massively undercounting their uh tank destruction and damage figures um, I think 153 RAC are very, very guilty of it. Um, but that's also because of the nature of how they're gaining the data, uh, gaining those data and where the inputs are coming from. If it's radios and your chaps are more concerned about fighting, the reporting back kills, which is really likely. Um, yeah, and, and both sides are routinely using smoke, uh, smoke generators on engine decks and stuff to simulate destruction. Oh, I'm on fire. They're both shooting as a matter of policy to the enemy burn. So not all tanks are burnt out, but it is a matter of basic policy. And you find this in dozens of camps. Shoot till they burn, shoot till they burn, shoot till they burn, shoot till they burn. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, this is sort of less a myth, just a point of interest. 75 millimeter HE is useless against dug in infantry. Now, I know I'm upsetting people saying that, but it's not it's not cutting the mustard. 88 isn't really cutting the mustard. Uh, well, anything over that. Yeah, it is. Uh, Sturmpanzer in Normandy does really well in the few occasions they use it, but I've got intense emotions about how the Germans employ Sturmpanzer. They have a fantastic vehicle when it, which fits their doctrine, and they just don't understand how to how to throw it in. Um, just a good yes. point from William Nance, John, who did, of course, the cavalry group show with us, who knows his stuff in American cavalry groups. Damage is also relative. Catastrophic damage versus damage and repair, which brings us to that maintenance we talked about with Arthur Gullickson, whatever it was, six months ago, about the Canadian almost... Um, triage system they had with their tank recovery you know citing damaged tanks lost tanks you've got to explain what happened to them next are they recovered are they not it's all about the context isn't it context has come about 20 times in the sidebar already about the needs to keep armor within context yeah so i, I so i just i've got two keyboards laid out so i have to be careful not to press the wrong one for this one um but german light damage is less than 16 hours to fix Medium damage is between 16 and 60 hours in a battalion workshop. Severe damage is in an army workshop or sent back to Germany, which is effectively destroyed. That's a yeah, bug of beyond repair. Um, but they're not always struck off strength, whereas British tanks can be quite easily. There's quite a lot of British tanks you see sent back and stuff, which probably shouldn't have been, in, which the Germans would have kept on strength. So you can't compare those stats like for like. And 60 hours of repair is substantial. That was what the Brits would be doing in an army workshop and stuff like that. Uh, your lads, your lot aid department uh, detachments as well will not be touching that sort of thing. So yeah, sorry, I had to I had to jump through my my list to dig up that one. Um, but uh, and I don't have the British uh, criteria in front of me because of course I didn't. Why, why would I think of including that today? Um, so yeah, uh, seventy five millimeter is inadequate. So there's a lot of things where you're like, well, why aren't they just achieving these goals? This can't be that hard. Well, you need a pretty good hit with seventy five millimeter HE, and everyone's using covered slip trenches in Normandy pretty much. Um, so you're everyone, every two or three men are in a little fortress. Um, when we're talking about armor as well, I'll come back to my earlier comment about historians focusing on a single, single, single little bubble. You have to expand it a bit. Um, we take loads of stuff for granted. So the recce troops involvement in most battles is taken for granted. You don't read about it because they're just doing their job. Like infantry battalions and mortars, 
no one really writes about the Maltese. They're always engaged to a large extent. Um, so assets to be taken for granted on British armour is smoke from the two-inch mortars, engine canister, uh, canister ones. Uh, in addition to that, what we try and do is we try to we try to we know the enemy have really good guns. So you know that a tiger tank from Hill 112 will pen your Churchill pulling over Hill 113. It's got a good chance of doing that. But if you lay a smoke screen between that, they can't see you. So we use lots of smoke screens, but smoke shells are at a premium throughout the campaign. There is also a whole little legal scuttlebutt about whether they're gassing the Germans or not. Um, and that's why we stopped using uh, white phosphorus grenades in the anti-personnel role, um, because it was over Geneva. We were thought to be gassing the enemy, not burning them to life, uh, to death horribly. Um, but this is often, and the use of indirect use of beasts to suppress is often below the layer of abstraction. So we're not, we're not, we're not talking about uh, these key sort of pieces of kit that are being used and employed. And so you have to expand your sources out a lot to answer these questions. Uh, it's not, it's not just that you can't just write off the units accounts. Um, for years, I've wanted to do a book on one for one Royal Armoured Corps. I may eventually do it. But again, for the rule, you have to expand out that accounts. Oh, I could write a book about the tanks, but lots of the crew didn't talk about it. So then you're looking at the infantry, the supporting tanks, the supporting Arctic gunners and all that stuff to try and get the answer. Um, uh, when it comes to one of the most interesting things, I'm going to throw out one of my coolest bits of research. Um, during Operation Goodwood, the British Army believed that 1st SS Panzer had redeployed to Hill 112 to counter Operation Green Line. Why was that? Uh, that's because the uh, after engagements, intelligence officers would crawl over any tank they could find to try and get ID quick and fast because they wanted it relayed uh, to Army Group. Um, and they found five Panzer IVs knocked out on Hill 113 that had charged over the crest. Uh, these five Panzer IV IVs were just left from 1st SS Panzer. Uh, they were left to back up, uh, I think it was 9th SS or 10th SS, 10th uh, or 9th SS, either one, uh, uh, and strengthen the line. This intelligence was misinterpreted by Pro First Army Group to say the entire division had redeployed to take on Operation Green Line when it hadn't. And that's why that weird quirk of Goodwood Int, which is forwarded all the way up, all the way up and seen as grade A stuff is uh, one of the reasons that Goodwood runs into trouble. If they were told there was an extra arm, uh, Panzer division facing them, um, I think that certain modifications would probably have been made. But they would they were under the impression that First SS ain't going to be involved. There's an entire what 200 tanks not going to be turning up today, ace. Um, so yeah, um, Beforehand, during training, the British Army did have problems with Rangers as well. I mean, we didn't have enough of them. For the armoured brigade, for the a lot of the independent and uh, tank and armoured uh, brigades have been stuck in mixed divisions for a while. If you look into the accounts of their training with them, they tend to basically be feel like they're idiots trundling alongside infantry, playing the role of the tank the whole time and not doing any tank training. For a lot of them, once the mixed divisions are gone, that's when their training really starts. Um, and there's a lot of frustration you get from, uh, in accounts um regarding that so and there's we lack rangers as a whole so our gunners are they getting enough practice in i'll, I'll come back to firefly in a bit um oh yeah fuel fuel and resupply so we think of tank i mean everyone who's played a video game thinks that tanks charge on and off they go back and resupply does loads of times i think uh during battle for thury hardcore i believe 147 or 14 uh 147 royal armored corps uh they resupply i think it's three or four times fuel and they're only making tiny advances but driving back four miles refueling driving back then another four and you're not driving at efficient rates you're you're in a combat situation you need to do it quickly you shuffle around in action you're you're burning fuel and ammunition at every point and then you go back and get some more go back and get some more go and some more it's a real like strange process it's not shown in any film how how these resupplies are running and that's how the british are constantly going keeping things topped up top 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 um so it's less armored charges think more shuffling engagements we're not talking great swan 25 miles a day two three miles a day is good in normandy that's what everyone thinks goodwood's awesome getting like seven nine miles or so you know that's that's great gains because the gains are so small normally uh and you're having to advance down infrastructure that just can't support it um one of the other th points, and now this is why I come to Congo. Uh, this feels really unstructured. There is there is a gist. We'll, we'll get to the real structure. Okay. Congo was meant to rapidly breach minefields, not crab. Crab was the slow, reliable system. Congo was meant to be fast. Congo's the crazy nitroglycerin in the universe. A carrier fires the rocket, rocket lands, and it all blows up um, and clears you what, 180, 180 uh, yards long and like 
20 feet wide path, no, 10 feet wide path. Uh, the US Marines and stuff used kit like that today to a very, uh, very good level. It was really too advanced for its time. There's some odd stuff going on about how the crews were employing it. I think they were very reluctant to use it in combat because they just thought it was a death trap. Uh, and then the, the, the accident in October um, uh, 44, where, you know, the refueling accident kills, what, 60 men in an absolutely massive blast. Um, that kills that off. But Conga was meant to be this rapid breaching technique. They do try and use it in Normandy several times, but it doesn't come off. Uh, it may have actually been used, and I've not found it yet. I've, I'm always chasing Conga stuff because it's a very curious weapon system. Crab slow, crab advances at 1.5 to 2 miles when clearing. And after two bursts, you have to, two blasts, you have to pull the crab off, and possibly three, two or three. You have to pull the crab off, and you have to get another vehicle in. That's why they operate in twos or threes. Because your attrition rate on crab to clear minefields is quite substantial. And yeah, they never then... talk about that. The replacement of the chains. It's it, if if they're doing their job properly, they're losing their chains, which means you keep have to replacing them. So yeah, yeah they never that never gets mentioned. When when we see that wonderful clip of the cra the Sherman crabs going across, they never seem to explain how how much damage that is doing to the system. Yeah, and it can cause critical failure as well. Um, so yeah, and uh, uh, during Operation Green Line as well, one crab goes over a, a mine and actually it's Crab or Ch Churchill and blocks the mo blocks the clear path and delays the employment of an armored regiment by what twelve hours because they have to go they have to go through it by hand because you know you can't risk more vehicles trying to clear another path. So these are all things which we really forget. Which these systems are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But we see the cool meme, you see the cool clip, you think it's great. Uh, crabs oversold for me by quite a large extent. Um, oh yeah one of the most curious points there's some really cool stuff so before Normandy there's some really interesting briefings and what they get briefed about Churchill there are briefings about Churchill to the Churchill tanks and they're told that Churchill tanks uh, armament is not a threat to their tanks and this goes out because they're looking at Churchill's they've taken out east um, which I'm still very keen to hear about uh, and they're looking at Churchill tanks from Dieppe using older grades of munitions and stuff. Now, they don't see Churchill as a threat, and this is relayed to quite a few units. Um, uh, 9th and 10th SS are definitely operating under this basis in 2nd SS Panzer Corps. And when you look at their armoured losses engaging, uh, or in damage rates, engaging tanks up close, they do not see 6-pounder or 75mm as a threat to them. They are threats. So those crews are pressing very dangerous tactics. What they think are in safe thresholds, they're not. They're vulnerable. And we need to understand that, that the German crews think they're operating in a safe manner when they are they've been their int is off. And there's been no attempt. No one's thought there may be an improvement in munitions or stuff. Um, at the same time as well, Panzalia sends this report round that states that British infantry are crap, which ultimately advocates the 21st July attack at Le Bon Report, but that um, they were impressed by the quality of British tanks. Now, hold on. Why are Panzalia impressed by British tanks? Because the Germans think British tanks are useless and tankers are useless. Why is that happening? Oh, it's because they were all right, you know. Um, and that report well, is I mean, just, just, as well. Let, let's just stop and confirm that point there, because there's a couple of people in the sidebar kind of saying, what's this talk? What, 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 not what's the point of this talk, but kind of where are we going with it? And I do admit, and I have no apologies for it, it's not very structured, but we don't care because we love the stuff that's coming out of your head. So that's not a criticism, but... You know, we, we are trying to combat this idea that you can read on numerous you know, books and YouTube sites that British tanks are ineffective. The German ones are better. The Germans have no nothing to worry about. They're not scared of us. We're, the British, conversely, are scared of bumping into tigers around every corner. And now you're tell giving us this bombshell that actually the Germans are considering British armor is quite good. This yeah. is... This is worth just underlining that statement there because this is what again this is from this is from this is sourced isn't it this isn't this isn't coming out of your head this is sourced information yeah actually it's all in my book uh, all the references to this stuff this was all these basically when I was writing my book I I got stuck down the British armoured rabbit hole and part of the reason it's part of the reason it's a bit more free flowing is because there's so many little strands and I want to this aim is to throw these out and people to think about them look into them and dig further. And I want to throw in this sort of zany logic. I, oh, I'm always playing around with new ways to do things, um, because if we if we if we just look at tactical studies, we, I could do three or four tactical studies this evening, and they, they would be fun. But all what we do is we try and throw loads and loads and loads of nuggets out from loads of studies, uh, and just just see what sticks. Um, uh, so yeah, one of the other problems was that 
one of the big problems with Churchill tanks, actually bizarrely more than Sherman, and I've never found an answer for this, is that the WS-38 set, the standard infantry platoon radio set, is completely drowned out when in proximity to a Churchill, but not necessarily to a uh, Sherman. Um, and this it, this means that they can't they can't communicate with the tanks they're meant to be able to speak to, and they often can't communicate back to platoon. Uh, in contrast, the uh, tanks uh, 19 sets are very good. They also, they also, uh, some of them get retrofitted with uh, 38 sets as standard, so they can talk to the supporting platoons, you know, very easily. But there's a big problem with big problem with getting this to work. Um, there's a huge importance. I mean, wireless operation in the Second World War is a really complex topic. Um, lots of radio hams now are fantastic at it, but they've had far more practice than anyone uh, would have done during the war. There's uh, quotes like a mysterious abracadabra. Is, are used regarding it and that's probably why joe ekins gets sent away from gunnery to wireless op he's a better wireless op than a gunnery gunnery officer as well, sorry you know a gunner, a gunner yeah and so why why keep what why have your good wireless op on a gun for a modern military that relies on tech and tech tech and communication to function efficiently you want him on the radio set and these sort of things get lost that this kit is complicated um the 19th set it means that the tanks are far more resilient in comms, uh, in, um, in Ch uh, Churchill's especially. So they can better coordinate with the infantry. So sometimes you'll get infantry just broadcasting back to battalion via the tanky net because that's far more reliable to use that. Uh, and they sometimes will give uh, Churchill tanks to British infantry battalion commanders to allow them to help coordinate their infantry in an attack. Um, uh, actually, I should come to one point in a second. Uh, in Normandy as well, the, one of the biggest problems is that terrain greatly benefits the defender. So in case studies, when the Germans try and attack with heavy armour, they suffer for it. And terrain is found to be much more challenging than expected. So when we're at advancing, we can't always get the carriers and half tracks through. Now, they, you see that clearly during Goodwood and you also see that towards valets. So often enough, our armoured units get slowed down to the pace of an infantryman because the soldiers have to dismount or cling to the vehicles. Uh, and it can easily reduce the um, an entire... Uh, armored brigades push of 180 tanks to three uh, to the leading troop of three or four tanks, and maybe a section of infantrymen or two which have managed to keep up with them. Um, small obstacles are a problem. Even even a tiny little stream really can stop a half track and carrier. Um, and these these problems uh, also are exacerbated because. Whereas you normally, I mean, if you watch all the films, you call an air support and blitz a target. In Normandy, you can't. I mean, it takes 45 minutes to two hours to get. <laughs> to get fire support like that on target. Tentacles are still developing. 11th Armoured is doing a lot of work as they push towards valets. Um, and there's are wider problems as well, which is aerial recognition patches are not always respected. And some of the IFF flares that units are carrying are also some of the ones are briefly used by the same air crews for designating targets. That does happen at times, that your firing flare are with friends and they go, oh, our target, thank you very much for, uh, for highlighting your position. And as the campaign gets more mobile, the risk of FF absolutely goes through the roof, absolutely rocks up. Um, so now we're going to progress. This is where, so the myths slide, it's all over the place because the myths are so so nebulous. Uh, I wanted to sort of throw it at them, just loads of stuff and get messy. But this is where, this is where we return to like orderly organisation. I say, uh, trying to tap on. Ah, oh, there we go. So this is where we go into Churchill's. If you notice wood on there, it's because one of the ones I photoed at home uh, a while ago, and I need to scan in. Um, Churchill before Normandy sees quite a lot of changes. So you get the ARV Coppola added, uh, not to all vehicles because they're in high demand and they're in short supply. Uh, and that means they get all round, effective all round vision. Uh, so suddenly British tanks have Coppolas in Normandy. Wouldn't have expected that. Um, we see a shift towards indirect fire being really pushed because all Churchills have with the 75 millimeter, they can get the triple vein sight fitted so they can be more efficient in their indirect gunnery. And if you look at the accounts of the campaign, they're frequently being called upon to act as like a light gun battery. Um, there are problems as well with the 75 millimeter conversions when they first do them. Uh, the muzzle brake uh, actually shoots off down the range because it's just screwed on and they have to then retrofit a new type of muzzle brake has to be developed with a screw running through it to keep it on the uh, on the barrel. Um, uh, it, it's, this is learning from Italy being brought to the UK in terms of the use of 75 millimeter moving forward. And a lot of them are, they're, they're reboard uh, uh, six pounders, aren't they? They're the same gun with the muzzle brake and stuff. Oh, but 75 millimeter. Um, 
there's a lot of notions that th these developments sometimes happen in theatre. And one of the most interesting one is up armoring. So the, the, what you read in most books is British tankies get scared of Tigers and Panthers and they whack loads of extra armor on their tanks. Now, applique armor was some of it was already welded on as standard on your Mark 3s and Mark 4s. But when it comes to all the additional stuff you see on top, you know, all the tracks being welded on, uh, they were trying to do that before invasion in from April to May. They were desperate to up armor tanks then. They thought, we want more protection for our vehicles. But there was a shortage of welders, so they couldn't get them in. Um, and when it came to upgunning the remaining sort of like six pounders, 75 millimeters, you could just do this in workshops. So if you, if you, well, the units could do it themselves, they didn't have to be factory through refits like, um, uh, like uh, Sherman Fireflies were. So we already see that through 75 millimeter edition of this dual purpose gun, that now Churchill's can engage, uh, engage a, a variety of targets more efficiently. Originally, they wanted to use 95 millimeter with six pounder to give them this sort of dual. Uh, dual uh, capability per troop, but the 75 millimeter from Italy is all the Italian experience really pushes that as being the uh, the right way forward. Mechanically as well, you've seen this tank, which is coming to service in what 40, 41. I know that some come out in 40, don't they? Sort of trundle off half broken because they developed it with the army and Vauxhall in this bizarre hybrid system where both crews were sent from one to the other. Um, it allowed them to have a very efficient tank. If you look at some of the 21st Army uh, Group records, Churchill is beating Sherman on reliability. And that doesn't that doesn't cut the accounts uh, much of the time. Um, uh, there is also another anecdote on the Churchill 7, which does crop up, which is the armor plate. One of them gets hit by a mortar bomb, uh, which causes the front glacis to drop. Um, it's, a, it's actually a horror story, this story. I'm going to tone this down massively. Um, and uh, breaks the front glazes. Um, it actually turned out it was a, 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 a large caliber German shell did it, which cracked the front glazes. It's the only account I found in the campaign, but it's stated as being a normal problem and beyond. I've not seen another one of these occurring. But if you read most accounts, it states it's a, it's a, it's a, a fairly common problem with the Church and Seven. Um, and it's sent back to the UK for analysis. Ricky Richards is sent to go have a look at it, but doesn't arrive uh, in time to have a shafty. So, yeah, the way that Churchills are used is you, broadly speaking, now this doesn't apply for all units because, of course, some of them carry on using just 75s. Um, but the you want, broadly speaking, two 75mm guns per troop and a six-pounder for tank hunting. So you get this balanced asset. Um, and this remains fairly popular even when they shift to four-tank troop structure after the campaign or towards the end of the campaign. It does vary from unit to unit. Um, if you want to request Sabbat for your six pounder, you've got to go to court and you always need a good reason. Uh, actually, or words to that effect, which crop up. So you're normally working on APC or ABC, uh, APCBC uh, for your armoured, uh, for your, to eliminate armour. Um, ammo expenditure as well is quite substantial. So each Churchill firing six belts of uh, Bisa in a raid as standard to suppress an enemy uh, from one squadron would equate to 43,000 thousand rounds or to fifty thousand rounds of ammunition so again this is the whole resupply thing cropping up they have seen mm. both ammunition being used in this indirect task which are very which are common and we don't talk about them um and they're often backed up so usually you should have a troop uh, sorry a squadron of churchills backed up by a troop or of uh m10 17 pounders and this actually means your standard churchill tank squadron is punching with much higher anti-tank capability serious anti-tank capability than the equivalent armored squadron in an armored division or um uh, independent armored squadron so you've got the, the church regiment should be viewed as proper combined arms assets which we then yes um uh proper combined arms assets which we often sort of lose down the way um and the three tank troop structure is popular early on because it's the one we've been using for the war, but they really buy Normandy for, throughout the course of the campaign. They discover that the minute you use one tank, your efficiency is down quite a lot. You lose two, you're useless. So that's why they try to shift from five troops of three, some five troops of three, to four troops of four uh, to try and have more resilient formations in battle. And then you've got your HQ troop where your Churchill 75, uh, sorry, Churchill 95 millimeter crops up. Um, so the Churchill uh, is, when it comes to it being employed as an infantry tank, it will get the job done because it's backed by all this other kit. And it does have good armor penetration, and most engagements are below 1,000 yards. And um, It will be where, as I said the other night, where first shot hits, it's going to get the results. So Just, just, just for a second, elaborate on that 
most engagements at less than a thousand yards because I, I'm just trying to make sure we keep this show accessible for the people who are not quite the armor British Army nuts that some of us are. You know, we we talk about the comparative ranges of things. You'll see lots of things how the tiger can fire, how many miles a tiger can fire, and things like that, and and these comparative ranges. And there was a question earlier about the range of guns. I would say not only is it less than a thousand yards, it, it's probably a lot less than that on average. Is that right? Yeah, uh, often enough. It, it's also, I mean, the the terrain's changed around Hill One One Two. Actually, I've got. Aerial for photograph coming up. Um, thousand yard range is seen as sort of like the optimal sort of engagement range, but we we have problems even achieving that accurately. Uh, Firefly has serious problems with accuracy, which we don't often talk about. So you want you want to be able to hit your enemy at a range where your armor will still provide protection, because that's the range where you should be getting protection. And if your enemy can pen you at a thousand yards, you're in trouble, because that's sort of seen as the gold standard sort of range for most engagements. Also gunnery, I mean, there's 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 no, uh, there's, this is all done totally analog by the Mark One eyeball and a gun sight. Um, so quite a lot of good good tricks needed to get rounds on target. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, some engagements in Normandy, the closest I found tank firing on tank so, so far is 35 yards. And that crops up in a bit, actually. Um, so, so yeah. Um, what the next one? We're looking at M10s a little more. So, M10s. These are crewed by the Royal Artillery. Uh, they are not tanks. They are self-propelled guns. Uh, and these are integral anti-tank assets held at a core level, and they're often allocated on a troop or squadron basis in support of other assets, such as your tank regiments. Yeah, if this is an introduction to British Army, I've gone quite hard quite fast. I should probably restructure this whole yeah, thing the if, other way if, around. Yeah. If people haven't got the O level, they're going to struggle with this if this is a Masters. Yeah, but we, yeah, but the point is, you know, people are saying, you know, some of these, the shows I do, some of them are kind of entry level, some are other level. This is, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So there we are. And it is my channel. So if I'm enjoying it, then hopefully that will spread out, but spread the love. Yeah, no, no. Um, so, uh, so yeah, sorry, I was, I was just checking, I was just checking the comments then. Um, one of the key things with the M10 is we overlook it because it's taken to be an integral asset in most ar armored engagements. So you also have to look at different documents. And I can, I'm, I'm going to shut up on that because hopefully people are thinking a bit about what, what sources we look at, what we prioritize. Um, actually, I've jumped one too far forward. Um, but because it takes time to get an towed anti tank up and dug in quickly, there's the, the advantage of self-propelled anti-tank guns really good. They tend to hang back and shoot at shoot targets as they present themselves or as they're called up to deal with targets. There are accounts of Tigers backing off and stuff, just seeing 17-pounder equipped and 6-pound, 3-inch uh, equipped uh, M10s. Um, they try armoured roofs as well in Normandy. Some people say it's afterwards there is a trial in Normandy. But they're mistransited by infantry because infantry just see them as absolute missile targets. But they're very important for, especially for armored uh, for church walls, because they're that additional belt and brace which should be supporting you as you close with the enemy. And if you can't handle something, if your six pounder ain't cutting it, well, one you can request arty, but two you can request arty and have your uh, your six pounders coming up to give them a bad day. Uh, sorry, your M10s coming up to give them a bad day. Now though. Now we get onto Firefly, and Firefly is, when it comes to British Army in Normandy, this is one of those key things. Before, Actually, before, before, future, before we move on from M10, yeah. we've got a question yeah. from the Great Dominion. Did they ever use a three-inch gun in the M10 or only the 17-pounder? Both in Normandy. There's a whole argument over this uh, online, and I think Rob Glennie is probably the person to answer it, not me. Um, yes, Yes, the, the, the tanks are getting regunned in theatre from three inch to seventeen pounder. I don't think they're sending them back to the UK. I think it's being done in theatre, but the they want them all to be seventeen pounder, not three inch, because three inch isn't offering enough. That you know, it's the effectively the seventy six millimeter gun the Americans are offering uh, are having and the same problems with that. Um, but yeah, there there is a mix, and some units are using both, and you can't always work out which tank when you read veteran accounts if they're talking about the same vehicle like duke girl one two and three you're trying to follow this and go oh wait hold on is this definitely that tank is it definitely seven sorry armor vehicle is it definitely an sp with a 17 pounder or a three inch gun you can't always follow that and the records for those units aren't always great and the 21st army group records aren't always as great as you want uh which is a bit frustrating so yes they are they are using both uh but eventually we see a push towards getting them all up to 17 pounder standard um, cool. I'm sure there's some three inch gun kicking bouts at the end of the war, but 17 pounder is so much better uh, in terms of punch. So 
on Firefly, I'm going to, this would be my, I'm going to do a really light one. Sherman's amazing. I love Sherman. Sherman's Lego. Like, I've actually, I've actually made one. There you go. Well, this people is gonna be people requesting to see some of your, more of your models. So there the, we are. Good. These are by Warlord Games. And a mate of mine works there, and they never send me freebies, and they should because they're really nice models. And I know Rubicon's bearing down their throat. There's there's gossip. Everyone likes twenty eight millimeter war game gossip about which is the best miniatures company. Uh, but yeah, th these are really good. So the Firefly comes out, um, and it's 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 a build on this modular vehicle, which has been in. I mean, when the suspension's been used from nineteen thirty two, it's a high it, it, the, the earliest models. This is a proven tank. We're just building on it and we're whacking on a better gun. And there's all the palaver of getting the right number of crew in, getting a good amount of ammunition in. Absolute palaver. And it was a real rush um, after 1943 when the policy on tanks, which you can see on screen, stated that we wanted this vehicle that really could engage uh, heavier tanks where the dual, dual purpose gun wasn't cutting it. Um, and its development history is convoluted and the gun gets shoved around and twisted upside down and back to front. And the first one they do basically rips itself apart because someone's doing their own trials projects. It's a great story. Mark Haywood's book is the best one out there. But if you can get hold of it, it's very, very good insight. I was just this thing after I finished the show with um, uh, General Bolger on whichever mm -hmm. day that was, uh, Tuesday, he was talking about the fact we were just talking online afterwards about how the Sherman tank is basically the forerunner of an, a modern and a modern, you know, the M1 Abrams, where it's a it's a weapons platform that is continually added to and modified as a as a kind of a a skeleton that you then develop, and and that's what it was, isn't it? And you say the, the, the some of the design goes back to the early 1930s, and it was still being used by the Israelis in the 70s and what have you, and so it was a forerunner for a modern system where you constantly upgrade the various components with it on a modular basis and so the, i have a lot of love for the sherman uh, as like you although can recognize certain weaknesses but as a platform i think it's unrivaled yeah yeah i I'd probably agree with that and i know i'm going to get shouted out by churchill fans now um, oh, i still i want to quantify <laughs> i still prefer the churchill I mean, <laughs> that's that's it. That, I know. in there but yeah the sherman is 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 a, the sherman is a, is a, is a, is more taking us to the future I think maybe is where I like the Sherman more than the Churchill was the right thing at the time there in 44. That's I'm going to quantify my preference there. there. There also was problems. I mean, like there's a lot of stuff to do with British tank development and tax and engine size uh, before the war and environment, basically environmental concerns of all things, uh, which is an area that people really could write on. Um, Callum Douglas, I think it's Callum Douglas is doing some amazing stuff on uh, German engines and British engines. Yeah. I would love to see him turn, turn his eyes to British vehicle development because yes. there's some really there's some big stories of them there's some really big stories there and that that caused us a lot of problems i mean like you know the show and five is running on um all those uh cobbled together uh, I think, uh bus engines um yeah. in the um uh, chrysler multibank um now when firefly reaches units um considering that in march 43 they really want this new vehicle out there they want this new type being rushed out there one of the problems they have is there's no time for familiarization. Uh, so in April 1944, units send cadres for initial familiarization. It's more watching the tank shoot. Now, Ekins claims something that he barely, he never fired a round or fired four rounds. It's something like that to do with it. But it only relates to Firefly. It cannot relate to gunnery with 75 mil and other things. The quote's been taken out of context. But we do know that gunners are not getting enough time on this platform. Uh, some of them are some units are sending off groups. Uh, some units take delivery of these vehicles in May 1944. So then there's barely any time for them to get get used to it. There's also serious problems with the gunnery. Um, so with APC at a thousand yards range, um, they found it only had a 45.3 percent chance of hitting a target. Um, and then if you use um, if you use Sabot. Uh, Sabot is only 14.9% at 1,000 yards. And crews were advised before the campaign, they told, oh, 17 pound is great, fantastic. It's guaranteed accurate to 450 yards. Now, obviously, close Normandy engagement, that's not such a problem. But if you're thinking that you're going to get out of Normandy and into the um, uh, open plains of France and push on towards Germany, that 1,000 yards range being reduced to 450 yards is quite a problem to a cruise yeah. to contend with. Now, why is this? Now, why is this? Now, 
it does not come out with good optics. I always go on about this because everyone misses it. It comes out with a number 43 telescope with three times magnification. There's nothing on there as well to accommodate for Sabot rounds um, as well. That comes later. And one of the key things we see introduced very quickly are new marks of uh, scope for Firefly. They do race into, race into Northwest Europe. I think it's uh, two or three times by the end of the war. Uh, which are much better than the number 43 to start with. Um, and this is not much better than the Sherman's offering, but you've got a specialist platform with a, to do a specialist tank hunting job, and you're giving it basically the same op optics as the Sherman. Um, this is woefully uh, inadequate. Now, I'm going to come back to the history for a second. There's about seven accounts of Farfly crew we rely on. It's really, really low. I mean, it's really low. If someone could find me 20 accounts, that'd be... That'd be and if you look at your, if you go for your books afterwards and check, you'll find the same accounts everyone quotes and the same experiences uh, being quoted again. And, and, again, and if you do it. that, folks, Chief if problem. you go and look up your Firefly quotes, look in the same book you're looking at for references to the optics not being very good, because I'm pretty much going to guarantee you're not going to find them. And that's this, you know, we are, we are, we are building on this narrative of the fact the Sherman Firefly is this sudden instant magic wand fairy godmother brings it to the battlefield solution to tank problems in norman it's just ace and fantastic and the fact is yeah it has some things about it that are good but if you can't hit if you can't aim the gun accurately having a better gun it, it doesn't make any difference does it no and the other problem they've got i mean is when the muscle blast is meant to be atrocious and th this though is disputed by some of the some of the accounts of far flight crews dispute that um, but we don't talk about it. Um, there's also a problem with fouling on the end of the muzzle break with rounds. They can foul it, and they aren't recorded as doing so. Um, uh, so when it comes to firing Sabot, well, you're probably going to be less accurate because it's got a faster flight, a flatter trajectory. The Sabot may click the clip the muzzle break, um, and it also puts a different demand of stress on the gunner doing mental trig. Uh, it's a completely different sort of thing. I know the gun always has to be flat, but it is a different kettle of fish. Um, and uh yeah uh, there's also meant to be some crews do complain of massive flash in the turret when it fires and all this sort of stuff and singed eyebrows i'm not sure that's happening because it doesn't correlate to other bits but again we're looking at a very 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 small number of accounts which people have used to base massive comments on, on this vehicle and it's crazy i mean when you think how many of them are and it's an iconic tank we should know way more about it but we don't spoiler um and this is this is what 70, 80 years ago this isn't, this isn't 2000 years ago we're not I'm not talking about uh, caesar stuff um and when uh, 44 rtr use guarded language to talk about their vehicles um and they would often call for the long things and that's your firefly i'm, I'm sure the germans struggled to work out the long thing was something scary um and in normandy a uh, carver actually got a load of them up and uh, had them blatting at panthers at 600 yards which had been knocked out with apc and they were they were penetrating that and quite happily so against static targets, they're fine. Um, but yeah, we, we sort of, they're, they're, and also they're used in different ways. Some of them are used by troop leaders, others aren't. Uh, different, you, no British armoured regiment is seemingly doing the same thing, even in the same brigade as to where their troop leaders are always ending up. So you have to be a little bit careful to check really carefully. Because sometimes I've been writing on, oh, the troop leaders in the Firefly. Oh, not in this unit. Ah, all right. So got to look at that a bit more. Um, but obviously, Firefly is iconic vehicle and integral for British success. Before we move on, Sean McCracken asks about um, was less than average accuracy ever accepted given the high rate of fire? Because that's something we didn't that you didn't talk about. The, the, the Firefly, does it have a higher rate of fire than the, 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 the 75 or 76? It's got a lower rate of fire. I can't recall off this from my head. Um, I, I have, the stats will be online somewhere. It's got a lower rate of fire because the shells are bigger and heavier. I mean, actually... Yeah. I, I, I mean, there you go. Here's a problem. This is a six pounder uh, Sabot round, actually, with a wooden head on it. Um, a wooden Sabot head. But again, this fully laden is pretty easy to move. When you start getting 75 millimeters, 70 pounder, the rounds get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so they're much more harder to manage in a confined space of these vehicles as well. I'm just putting it up from next to me. Uh, I'm not having to worry about that and getting into action and stuff. Um, yeah, you a lot of those accounts about race of fire and stuff, you won't see. That won't crop up as much. Uh, in indirect fire, they don't care. They're just whacking through rounds. They'll just be throwing them in and they'll be acting like a light artillery piece. Um, another key asset for British tankies in Normandy is this. And this is where we start, this is where we start to shift a little bit again. Um, so this is an aerial photograph of Hill 112 and it's taken on the 6th of July. Um, actually, I worked out and took this. 
years ago. Um, and it highlights stuff that I'm always interested in, which is uh, the uh, the uh, battle uh, for uh, the Bora Par SK and stuff. Um, now, maps like this, uh, aerial photographs like this were really useful because they gave ideas of the layout of the ground and German positions that you just couldn't get otherwise. And they were integral for planning uh, planning attacks. And as the campaign goes more mobile, though, we stop having access to these. The, the ability to deliver these on time, especially because there's a problem with American maps in certain units, American produced maps, uh, becomes harder and harder. And these are really useful for tank tankies to go, oh, you're probably going to have an anti-tank gun there so we can prep these charges. And we can have the record troop go check that out and all this sort of stuff. Um, and if you look at that as well, you can see nice open ranges. So this is where you want to lay your smoke to restrict that battlefield. So the Brits can use RT to create much smaller battlefields on very big expanses like around Hill 112, Hill 113, the whole Everest Ridge area. You can cut those down with careful application of smoke to just box off the enemy. And the enemy cannot do anything about that. They will not be able to respond. And that allows you to throw an armoured regiment backing up a, a company of infantry to absolutely haze the hell out of the enemy. Um, which is something we, we really do sort of look past quite a lot. But these were integral, these were loved uh, by those who got them on the ground. And I have to say, I've never thought about the fact that those oblique photos give a different advantage over the standard straight down aerial photos. Yeah, I've never, I like they that. Were, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to take that thought away and think about that when I'm sitting in bed later. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. They would give, um, there's also, you find notes about uh, map packs being, uh, photo packs getting, getting given. Uh, a lot of this stuff we don't always have, and they're combining this. So you'd gain all the uh, layers of intel all the way down can be filled into this. So if your aerial observer is shelled uh, a gun position over there, you can get, uh, you can mark that on them as well. They'd often replace, add models to this. Cloth models are common, really common. Um, so, yeah. I really, just have really another good. question, just because mm -hmm. well, in case we move on, a couple of people asked this about supply and maintenance. You're talking about various types, you know, we're talking about six pounders, M10s, we're talking about troops with different types of guns within the same unit. You know, you're putting more of a strain on supply and maintenance because lots of different types of shell, lots of, lots of, lots of different types of everything. The, I mean, it's a, it's a, I know the answer to this question. The more different things you've got within any unit, the more difficult the supply issues are going to be. But is there stuff recorded about this? Is this was this something the British Army were worried about in '44 in the summer? Uh, so I mean, like uh, the standard British tank regiment, uh, as in tank with Churchills, they've got three main calibers: 75, six pounder, 95 millimeter. Uh, that's not that's not too hard to manage. Um, your RT is all standardised. This is probably the most varied area it, the bigger problem is in some units like four farmer brigade where they end up with i think four, four four different types of sherman engine at times they're trying to manage with all different parts that is a problem and that is a challenge for to keep maintained and serviced and stuff um but it's more when vehicles are left idling a lot in static conditions and that's just the general wear and tear of it is irritating but also churchill's had all gone through the rework program so your your basic churchill's all at the same sort of spec yes you've got your sevens that are the level above but they're all basically at the same level um so yeah so it's not it's not as bad as a problem as the germans are facing um so hopefully that's the sort of answer it's not something yeah, that pops up to us. And, the, and the service rates are pretty good i was surprised to see uh one churchill tanks goes for a thousand miles without a major service um which is ridiculous yes it's falling apart at the end of it uh but it goes for a thousand miles without a major service it's commander's tank who just wanted to keep it going um, so yeah, reliability is, is good. And also the unit fitters and stuff are very, very skilled, especially in Churchill units where they've dealt with crap for years. Many of them were sent to Vauxhall on courses and they consulted on the vehicles development as well. Um, so not talking about Ajax, but you know, Ajax program could have learned something perhaps by better integration in those areas. Um, Churchill, again, a fantastic case study. So what we're going to look at next is we're going to look at, um, I'm going to try and whiz through a couple of interesting sort of tactical things. Uh, which will mostly be Churchill based. I apologise for those wanting more Shermans. I got because I knew I knew this was going to get too long. I knew this was going to get too long. So what I want to do is I want to talk about Operation Green Line uh, a little bit. Phase two A, which is Dunbar, uh, and this deals with. Uh, this is all. These are not the right unit, but this all deals with one five three Royal Armoured Corps. These are mostly images of one hundred seven Royal Armoured Corps um, and one five three Royal Armoured Corps. The Essex boys. And they had a plan to take Gavris and Bougie. And I, I could have dragged my map off, but I, I didn't put up on time. Um, and it was concocted by Timberwood of 153 Royal Armoured Corps and Delacombe of 8 Royal Scots. And they both attended staff college together. They were mates and they get given an op. They come up with a plan. It's resilient and it succeeds. Um, and, and 
both become casualties and it still carries through. It's worth mentioning as well, this is where someone's name for Churchill Keen Beans crops up again, which is Norris King. Norris King, commander of King Force, crops up in Normandy as 153 Royal Armour Corps, two, second in command, um, who we don't talk about after North Africa, really. Um, <laughs> I don't know why this happens. We just forget Norris King sort of exists. Um, the plan was for eight Royal Squats to clear both villages. The Churchills will drive round them using the Hill 113's uh, slope, deploy in there, Cut the enemy reinforcements off, take one village, go around the next one, take that. It's pretty, pretty simple. They get shelled on the start line. I'm not going to focus on the infantry experience. We can cover that another day in, in, in combined because we're just focusing on armour. It starts at 5.30 in the morning and on 16th July 1944. Yeah, it works. They get around Gavris, take a load of prisoners, a few casualties, but mostly prisoners. Pass through Gavris, go to Bougie, go around again, take 100 prisoners. Yeah, have a bit of shootout with a couple of German tanks. All good. Now, where this gets more interesting is early on, Timber Wood shouts at us, tells, tells one crew in C Squadron to stop shooting because they fire a burst of 792 too early. And he said, no shooting until targets are definitely sighted because they're going early in the morning. They don't want the enemy to know there's an entire armoured regiment coming their way with an infantry battalion. Uh, but the infantry battalion do play their pipes. A Royal Scots do play their pipes early. See, you know, there's quite a bit of noise going on. Um, Delicum gets wounded on the start line of eight Royal Scots and passing his command to his second in command. Actually, no, I think he gets wounded on Hill 113. Apologies. Um, and the morning is not too bad. They get strafed by Fogger Wolf 190 that come in, a few of them, which scrap with a load of Osters. And this is crazy little old aerial battle going on with little dinky Osters at 100 miles an hour versus like 400 mile an hour fighters. Um, and Bougie itself, when they reach the objective, they clear it in 17 minutes and take 100 prisoners because, you know, you got tanks blatting at you. So then the infantry consolidate, bring the anti-tank guns up and dig in. Uh, well, and they're basically now waiting for six Royal Scots Fusiliers to take over uh, uh, Gavris. Wood is shot when clambering back into his tank near Bougie, and that sees King, more Norris King take command of the situation. But at one o'clock, a counterattack starts to build because 9th SS throw their assets at it. Now, this is a great one because this battle contains Panthers, Stugs, everything like that you want to know about. Um, and they try to call around Bougie, basically do the same thing that the Churchills have done and muck it up. And they've got infantry support. They destroy the intelligence officer's tank and with it, the war diary. It comes a total slogging match as it goes on. Uh, seventh and eighth companies, Stugs from 2nd Battalion, 9th SS Panzers participate. And 277 Infantry Fusilier try to go into action to be supported by 9th SS or, 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 or Clarons. I can't talk today. They all get picked up and they get shelled by Foos, which basically breaks the 277th Infantry's counterattack and the 9th SS one, and 9th SS Armoured Reconnaissance involvement. And this, this is a curious one because that happens, you know, by about three o'clock, this initial attack's gone a bit messy. Uh, and Horst van Wangenheim of 277th Infantry, who's one of the senior officers, he said it becomes evident that counterattack without the support of tanks will never be successful against so superior an enemy in respect of material. So, whoa, hold on. This is the sort of thing you'd expect them to say about the British. What, why are the Germans complaining about this sort of thing? Um, and it's almost certain the armoured cars were spied by a foo and whacked out. So again, the foos, you know, they're watching out for the tanks and they have a uh, 24 uh, field regiment on standby, solely dedicated to supporting the Churchills. After lunch, the battle keeps escalating as the more Panthers get involved and more Stugs get involved. Casualties mount and it becomes a proper brawl. Uh, this is where um, this is where the tanks are basically they're able to use the Churchills are able to use the ground to their advantage because it's all a bit rough and conceal themselves in three foot high crops and some five foot high crops along hedgerows behind buildings and the advance grinds through troop after troop being knocked out very 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 slowly um during it there's a counterattack though where one one troop goes over the hill and the, the lead tanks knocked out and that ends up giving all the plans for the operation to the ss um which sees their divisional commander hyper fixate on trying to manage this tactical battle and second ss panzer corps gets really sucked into a form of decision making being dominated by div commander sylvester slat dadler focusing at like a regimental level or even a battalion level and obsessing about the gavras and bougie and trying to stabilize this thing um and that report ends up getting forwarded to rommel that they want to push out through ever say and you may notice on the 17th of july he goes and visits this sector because he's so nervous on the day he gets straight it's one of the reasons he, he takes this route so it ultimately contributes to rommel having a very bad day the 
shootouts in the streets basically become point blank in the village. Uh, there's a Panzer IV knocked out. Uh, uh, what, uh, seven troops, Bella Ward, sees a panther at 35 yards, engages it, and shoves Bella Ward into a reverse, which smashes it through a building. Building collapses around it. You've got Churchill smashing through buildings, panthers smashing through buildings, infantry with peats running about and grenades. Absolute pandemonium and the germans managed to break them up a little bit but they refused to budge one five through royal armored corps could draw but doesn't uh and norris king does gives the order basically to stand their ground and they're not going to budge at all by the end of it um the uh, the other regiments are now listening into what's happening so conventionally if you're saying someone says to me you get panthers and stugs and ss panther grenadier they're counter attacking a single british infantry battalion and basically two two armoured squadrons at the forefront of it, you'd put all your money on the Panthers and the Stugs any day of the week, especially backed by uh, 2nd SS Panzer Corps artillery and the associated stuff from Panzer Group West. Um, but this doesn't happen. The, the, the Panthers and Stugs do not know they're vulnerable to 675mm gun. And it's basically a repeat of the 1st of July to an extent when they try and crack the Scottish Corridor. This results in a pretty balanced engagement because everyone's at such close range. Any impact is going to cause catastrophic damage. Crews are bailing out repeatedly, diving back in. They're firing their mortars. They're redeploying. They're shutting about. It's this is this is the British tanky, I would argue, at probably their best in Northwest Europe. They're fighting very, very, very close confines engagements. And they they are giving the enemy with vehicles which are not to the same spec. I mean, Panther weighs what? 30 percent more. Um that's no, more than 30, yeah, it's 30 percent more. Or 30 to 50 percent more. Um, and as a result, over time, the favour starts falling in favour of the British. Uh, it also sees um, uh, one troop leader with his Churchill, uh, Churchill Five knock out a Panther with a 95 millimeter round. Uh, which, if you look, if you check certain accounts, they, historians will claim the 95 millimeter was never used against tanks. Well, it definitely was. So we're seeing this round, which is basically a giant Hesh round, trashing enemy armor. Um, so when the battle finishes, though, the 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 accounts from 153 Royal Armor Corps are quite interesting. Their, their casualties are pretty awful. I mean, uh, Green Line as a whole leaves 34 tank brigade with 87 serviceable gun tanks out of 150. 153 Royal Armoured Corps lose two squadron leaders, 13 of, of, other officers killed and wounded, eight other ranks killed, 43 wounded and 13 missing. 153 Royal Armoured Corps are down to 29 Churchills. So you lose basically half the regiment in one battle. Um and they, they conclude the fighting power of our individual tanks compared to those of the enemy, uh, Tigers and Panthers, is still scarcely equal. So, OK, the Brit loss for that are, uh, you know, oh, Churchill's useless. OK, this is this is this has not been successful. Uh, they claim two Tigers, which probably weren't involved. It's probably Panzer Fours, five Panthers, three Panzer Fours and two Stugs. And 12 Corps as a whole claims for 14 tanks. 12 Corps claims are very low. It's hard to substantiate, and they note that there's been lots of problems with casualties and stuff, and the risk of double counting and things. They don't, they don't, they're not really sure what damage they've done. But the German losses across the Green Line are much higher, uh, which equates to at least 41 tanks and self-propelled guns, uh, plus five more from First SS Panzer, which I mentioned way before. Which, so which the begs the question, John, and that gives you a, a break. A break for you've been talking, in, uh, which is great. Why don't we talk enough about Operation Green Line and or Pomni Granite? Why is it always the certain one? I mean, Goodwood seems to be the one that is everybody's favourite to discuss and debate and talk about. But Green Line doesn't doesn't register in most people's lists. Why is that? Or Cormorant. That's the other one which everyone really forgets. Uh, that's the other one. Um, because they're all the same operation. It's all the same plan. It just has, doesn't have a name. It's under notes of 15th to 18th July, you know. It all, it all gets washed away because we focus on operations and post-war British Army study hyperfixates on Goodwood because we need to stop the Russians. Uh, and this is a very damaging... It's, oh, I think it's, it's, people say it's still not tall. I talked to Sandhurst graduates from recent years who are still telling me this stuff. And I can guess the secondary literature they're consuming and YouTube documentaries are saying the same thing. Um, I find it odd. It's, it's at odds with what people at Sandhurst say. Uh, and Staff College. I, I've had people at Staff College tell me that good was the only thing that matters. I'm like, how are you getting to this result? Uh, I think we've. I think those institutions need to progress. Um, but they've got some great lecturers there. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a military mindset from the 80s and stuff, which is still cropping through, which pushes a singular view of operations uh, when they are all involved, and it increases the casualties for Goodwood by about 
6,000 casualties, four and a half, 6,000 casualties on the Brits, and blows the notion that it's just to write off, uh, you know, conserve infantry completely. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, this engagement is fascinating because the Germans actually do capture several, they claim to capture 11 Churchills, they don't get 11, uh, at least not running. Um, I suspect they're running a troop around Le Bon Repos for years. They're definitely running at least one captured Churchill. I suspect it is a troop around that area. Um, but it's fascinating. It's 153 Royal Armoured Corps. It's their first battle in the Normandy campaign. They get flung into it and they have to stand their ground against enemy using tanks 15 tonnes heavier. Uh, and they hold them off, and, and eight Royal Scots hold their ground. Both these units hold their ground. It's a fantastic example. I, I, I can do a talk on it probably another day with all the first-hand accounts and stuff. But it's a fantastic example of not being willing to budge in difficult situations, uh, which um, we don't talk about enough. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. So the next one I'm going to jump to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up because if anyone's got any questions, otherwise I can be here for like six days. When I started, when I came up with this title, I thought oh, I'll throw down a load of myths, I'll throw a few tactical studies, and then I got dragged back in. I thought I was out, and I got sucked right back in. Um, Jameson's VC is quite interesting. It's another Churchill one, but it's again quite an, quite an interesting indicating one. Um, the assault crossing at Grimbosk. I said I mentioned Grimbosk, so I've got to include this one. The assault and, crossing Sean, and Sean is watching. Sean, Sean Claxton is watching, who, who's a bit, a bit of a fan of that. And Nick Bad, I think, is watching as well, who's a bigger fan of that. So Grimbosk is one of those battles I want to feature at some point in the future with a live show. So uh, watch this space, folks. Yeah, Grimbosk is so important. If you're Canadian and watching this, by the way, and you think Totalize is special, Totalize wouldn't have happened if the assault crossing at Grimbosk never happened. It was insisted on by the Canadians. And if you read the army group documents, I mean, they insist on a distraction. They do not want to go in against 12th SS without 12th SS being distracted by something. It's a crazy engagement. It's got pretty much everything you'd want. Even my my much maligned Sturmpanzer turns up for once to blow things up. It's, yeah, Sturmpanzer gets its day. It's, it's, it's great, briefly. Uh, it's no longer that <coughs> hated stepchild, you know, being beaten by like the army group B who just don't know what to do with it. But what happens next is that 107 Royal Armoured Corps have a really bad day here. Um, their leading squadrons get absolutely savaged as they as 12th SS throws everything against them. And it, 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 they throw Tigers. They've got, they're operating with 102 SS, um, Ashfrey SS Banzer. They throw Camp Group of Kraus at them and Camp Group of Wunsch. They throw a lot of their available functioning. Oh, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, sextons are not so, some units have sextons some units don't some units get sextons taken away so for the independent armored brigades which like fourth armored brigade does have artillery um i believe they get upgraded to sextons i may be wrong at this stage i think they're using tow 25 pounders um and a lot of the uh, churchill based ones have no they don't have any integral artillery they're just tanks um but yeah so what i wanted to do is when you look at jameson's action which i view as one of the finest vcs and i think is really worthy of a drama or film because it's it's just ridiculous um unfortunately early on the wireless net collapses which complicates everything going over the river so you get runners from brigade and liaison officers fording the fording the odon the odon's very steep side and stuff it's one of the few points they can get actually cross at um and it's again the Churchill tank repositioning and scrapping around here, which is integral to success. With sometimes a single Churchill ending up backing a platoon as all their mates are knocked out, but one tank can just hold on. Uh, this this painting depicts Corporal William Donald Brooker's Churchill Three, uh, which is armed with six pounder. You may know in the picture it's not a Churchill Three; it's a <laughs> it's the wrong Churchill, and it's painted in the wrong colours with the wrong colour markings. Uh, but it's got James. And it doesn't even look like Normandy. The, the, no. the colours all wrong, but apart from that, we love apart, it. Yeah. Apart from that, yeah, yeah. If only, if only the artwork could be right. Um, uh, he was the last fighting tank of his troop, and he used during the beast fire to constantly help the enemy off. They just kept hitting him with mortar bombs, and you notice the Germans tend to throw loads of mortar bombs at tanks, probably because they know infantry in the vicinity, because they can see the. I suspect they can see the 38s at aerials and stuff, which we know they can see. Um, Donald hits. Uh, they, they when they get, they're getting charged down. Uh, by two tanks, and there's always the argument about uh, whether it's Tigers or Panthers or what, whatever vehicle it is. The first tank that tries to charge them down, he hits with a six-pounder, and it backs off. It stops, and it shunts up, so it sustains enough damage. The second one then comes in to try and take over, and he allegedly takes it out. Now, if we had a better photo record, I'm not going to go on that one of this, 
but we could say a lot better. The, the, the photo record for Normandy is in private collections and museums, and no one's collated it together, and it's crying shame. Um, but yes, Donald manages to do enough damage to, and to hold the enemy at length long enough that Jameson concludes they're in a strong defensive position that he can just call, call fire on their own position and clear the enemy out. There's quite a lot of other engagements by Church, Sherman, uh, Churchill's that day, which do hold the enemy. And again, when when things go bad, the tankies in the in 34 Tank Brigade tend to stick it and so take take the beating. They really are willing to do it, and a lot of them do see them as representing like Essex and stuff like that. There's just a re they're converted infantry battalions. They are representing um, all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah. At the end of the engagement as well, A and C squadrons are left with nine running Churchills. I mean, they're, they're practically destroyed. Um, and four, four, with uh, four more soon they manage to get running. But they lose 22 Churchills, of which 17 are completely burned out. Uh, there's some, some suggestion that the crews may have burnt them to prevent capture when they bailed, so they destroyed serviceable vehicles. That said, we know the Germans are shooting until the vehicles burn. So I like this engagement because it shows this... When I've looked at Churchill actions, you notice the crews not usually backing off as much as you probably would expect. They're taking the they're take taking the lashes and they're giving it, and it sort of sums that up quite nicely. Um, uh, actually, another one. I'll do I'll do one or two if that's okay. Do we have time? Yeah, we've got time. I, we're, we're, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. So, cool, so I'm, cool. I mean, generally, but just to interrupt you for a second and, and you know, looking at the conversation things like that. I mean. If there's one thing we can take away from this is that when you're examining British armour and indeed the British army generally in Normandy is kind of go beyond the what has been written and look across, spread out your learning. Um, certain battles, certain things, certain accounts, you know, so you talk about those seven Firefly accounts we have that kind of crop up everywhere. There is other information out there, but it needs time. It, it, we were talking, I was talking with, um, with Daniel again about the, 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 um, after the show about the, the that the the Holger Eckert's book when those German accounts all turned up that we now know are complete fabrications and you talked about that and Neil's talked about that we all want to find the easy solution in one place that's the dream is you go to a place and you find one dusty volume that gives you all the answers and you go ha ha that's everything I need the point is you need to go and look at lots and lots of sources and and, and if you go into archives and Sean Claxton goes to archives you go to archives you might have to go through 15 boxes of stuff to find a couple of things that are actually worth taking forward and using uh, and Dr Phil who was watching knows this as well that that's how you have to do it there are no easy answers you can't just pick up one book and understand British Army in Normandy that's that's it's too simple yeah yeah, it's, it's spread all over the shop. Um, it's a bit like I, I, I really like John Buckley's book on British armour in Normandy. I massively disagree with substantial parts of it, um, especially the bits where feedback loops, the um, stats on British tanks and attitudes and things like that, because ultimately historians can only be specialist in so many things. We all have limitations. So people noticing, I'm, I'm so sure people are picking up errors in here from what I'm saying. That's absolutely fine. I, I, I accept I'm, I'm, oh, we're all flawed. You can't get everything you can't be the expert in everything. That's why you need a great team. And that's why we work better by sharing our knowledge. And we're, I've got, you know, my whole shared heritage thing. Um, so what I'm going to do is look at a couple of other bits and then we can do some Q&A afterwards. Um, and we actually, we are getting, we are getting to Sherman's. I promise you, I promise you we're getting to some cool Sherman stuff and one or two bits, which sort of challenges maybe the accuracy uh, question a bit. So, I wanted to have a very, 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 very briefly look at hedge cutters, and you'll notice these all American tanks. Um, hedge cutters were used by the British. Uh, Four Armoured Brigade fit theirs between 13th and 14th of August. I think it's one per squadron. It's not many at all. And they rely on those tanks to try and lead the advance for increasingly uh, disruptive country. The problem they really have, though, is where the Sherman can get through, uh, the supporting vehicles can't. So you can't get your half tracks free. You can't get your carriers free. Now this was foreshadowed during um, uh, during Goodwood, but they encounter serious problems. Mike Carver in his memoirs, if you read them, he insinuates they sort of blitz through Falaise. He, they do not, and he does not live up to what he's selling to Fifth uh, Third Welsh Division and Twelfth Corps. To my mind, I would be very curious to see what if his predecessor had survived, what would have happened. Um, 
But Carver's young. He's a driving commander. He's very gifted and he's single-minded. But even he can't achieve getting results when your advance is limited down a single road, basically by three or four tanks. And we'll look at that in a little bit more depth shortly. But I wanted to have a look at the cu uh, cut and cutters because we don't think Brits use them. The Americans adopt them by what, 21st, 22nd, and then use them on the 25th of uh, July. But the Brits don't adopt them for like three weeks. Uh, there's a story why this is taking a while to filter back and across, uh, across sectors. Uh, and then afterwards, you see Churchill's, but Churchill don't need them. Churchill just go through. Churchill's fantastic. It just smashes yeah. everything to pieces. Um, so, yeah. Um, now, here we go. I know there are Sherman affection artists who've been hanging on for this sort of stuff. Um, and it's a real mishmash because if I want, if we want to talk about British Army very generally, we can say loads. If we talk really specifically, we talk so small. And I wanted to try and get both in here to an extent, which in hindsight was a bold move. But yeah. So Carver encounters serious problems employing armour as they push south towards Falaise. If you, if you look at Falaise and you see where the town is on the map and then you see the road left of it, that's pretty much 12 cores angle of advance. You're trying to send a coal cord down there with 59th Staffordshire hugging the line of the Odon, um, holding the line of the Orn. There's a very good, that's a great story. That's a very, very good story. 59th Staffordshire is something I'll always push. And I'm pushing Sean to write this book and he knows it um because he, he he will he will write the best one frankly um the terrain is basically impassable so we go from flat normandy and this is then when you get sort of like proper hellhole normandy which is all gullies sunken roads sunken road gullies streams rivers hills rat mounds dense woodland dense forest village hamlet fortress the germans know which where you're coming from because the germans look at a map and go you're coming south you have to be coming south they also realize pretty quickly uh, under 277th infantry division under paul danhauser works sorry 271st infantry division under paul danhauser works out there in serious trouble um and i credit danhauser with basically saving um a lot of the german forces uh generally and 12th ss's supporting battle groups are less relevant to his holding the line so they can create roadblock anti-tank position roadblock anti-tank position and they're just rolling the infantry back who are increasingly shagged out as they try this fourth armored brigade Paul also employs the stewards as additional armored squadrons so this is where you start seeing light armored squadrons of stewards trying to race about they're trying to find ways forward they're trying to report back to the tanks where possible with Sherman's to try and get them up within king's royal right king's royal rifle corps and the supporting infantry from uh 160 brigade and stuff who are then clinging onto vehicles but it's it's described by a major Herowood wake as a fox hunting nightmare which is sort of you know really summing things up quite nicely this terrain is absolutely awful and the next slide shows that now this this is from nam and i am i am damn certain that this is taken in the battle area i'm describing and it gives you an impression of the advance they're making where two or three miles if you look at planning documents they thought they'd get through this quite fast but the train is so awful uh the maps give no real indication of this um that they are absolutely slogging through and, it, and the german rearguards are actually fairly large at times and quite very well organized uh but they're increasingly operating on their own initiative um there's also serious problems they encounter with 33rd armored brigade who are supporting the canadians the two formations end up using the same frequencies and are talking across each other and it takes the best part of about 12 hours to sort out find them then agree a plan to try and shift nets without uh screwing things up for other formations um and their push towards Rufigny and Trepel is a pretty painful one. Um, so they can't keep the infantry up. The infantry in your half tracks and your carriers then basically have to act as tank riders. This gives the Germans more opportunities to ambush, which they don't seem to take so much because they're fighting on fixed lines. But again, you've now got a core of like, th let's say, 100,000 people pushing down with a single focus to push south of Falaise and cut these key key roads and entrap the German army and they're being led by two sections and three tanks and this is one of the huge problems in dealing with this they're also route running their arty this is a mobile I put a, a thread up recently about a battle in Normandy where they'd um it was a trap because all the stuff you got didn't work all your answers would fail because the you were outrunning your RT you don't have your agris to blast through you don't have your osters to really use it's a mobile campaign and the British army actually does I'd say relatively well but they're best fighting far more tidy campaigns where they can really sort of micromanage get the assets up and do all this sort of stuff but this is them trying to really roll the dice and this is this is this is Dempsey going for a slice and Richie slice through the Germans and cut them off this is sort of a smaller valet's gap which you could have had coming through uh, Operation Knife 2. Um, 
the on the 18th of August, they end up scrapping for a load of tigers and stuff. And this is where the fireflies and stuff, they sort of shoot it. It's, again, these are quite long ranged engagements because it does then open out a bit. And you go from this claustrophobic interior towards South Falaise, where it does open out, and you can have these longer range engagements, especially along ridge lines and stuff. But the Germans are determined to hold each ridge line because they know if they lose too many, you can just shoot through and that they will be unable to hold the main avenue of German troops running out who are already being hit by air power and also being shelled by long range guns. Um, the longest range kill recorded is apparently by a firefly at 2,400 yards against what appears to be a Panzer IV. And that is a brew up. So, and that vehicle is hit several times and then burns afterwards. And it's confirmed as brewed the next day. So that's nearly 1.4 miles. So we do see that the 17 pounder can perform at long range. And we see increasingly eclectic battle groups being conducted. We see them using more ca like carrier platoons and stuff and more half tracks carrying infantry forward to a point, dropping them off, give them whatever kit they need, send them forward with the tanks and things. There's lots of tactical creativity going forward. But suddenly I, I've stopped talking about tanks for a while now. And suddenly I'm talking about infantry, tanks, artillery again, because we've combined, we're back to the whole combined arms thing. And when you can integrate all these supporting assets, it works. When you can't, they start falling apart. You can't call air power. I mean, your tactical air power is going to take too long to get involved. Um, so it's a huge problem. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I wanted to finish. That's that. That's all sort of the end of it, really. That's sort of like, this is a rush with these knocked out tanks, which are destroyed in that sort of uh, area, um, which are Panzer IVs in a collection of other vehicles. Because when the, the Germans knew, as they lost their lines of retreat, especially north-south, because of the terrain, once the Brits gained one, once they gained one ridge line, they could easily shoot and engage columns on the next one, and it, that's where the German efforts went. And the German rear guards there, you get crazy stuff. You get um, Falschenjäger turning up suddenly for no reason, um, which I didn't believe was possible, but 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 they are Falschenjäger. You also get a, a random Becker convoys from two twenty first Panzer suddenly holding rear guards, and the leading British armor troops are told you're not going to face much armor. They know they've already dealt a pretty big blow to 102 Schrei SS. They know they dusted up a load of the uh, 12th SS uh, Panzers battle groups who've already been split up, and they lose quite a few vehicles in woodland and stuff in weird situations. Uh, there's some strange stories um, which they encounter difficulties in. And as we get to Falaise, uh, they keep encountering armour. And of course, as the pocket's closing, crews are arriving. And this is one place where you do have to acknowledge the Germans' ability. And I've gone on to a Falaise topic. But, but the German tank crews and uh, self propelled gun crews are saying, we're going to forego our chance of escape to let the infantry and the guns and the supply troops and all those people, they're getting out. We're going to make our stand here and take our chance later on. Uh, and I think there's quite a lot of bravery from those troops because yeah. they know once they're in position, there is no way out. Um, and the scrap for, uh, the scrap for Ruvigny and Trepel and stuff is astonishingly unpleasant stuff very 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 close quarters um and they do hold the brits at range and it's infuriating carver because he can't get his armor through and he's looking at me he's this is the guy he thinks he is the younger he's the youngest brig in the british army this is a guy getting things done and he's throwing all his assets at it and he can't really make an impact um now then you go okay cool let's flip flip the vehicles you get the same result because of the terrain i can't see it not really turning out any other way uh, and I think one of the biggest lessons from Normandy is uh, kit is part of the answer. The use of terrain and ingenious tactical employment troops is another side entirely, and both sides can do it. Um, and it's really when you're on the back foot, you see these tactical innovations and stuff, which do crop up just as in 1940, uh, which we can learn a lot from. So, so yeah, to summarize, with Sharma in Normandy, it's a mega topic. Yeah, and well, I've that, not even talked about the funnies really. I've just yeah, I mean it, it is. It's a mega. Let's go back and ask a few questions that hopefully we can go through reasonably, not quickly. Um, so Wardrow plays World War Two. So you told us the longest recording hit. What was the average kill distance? You said that of most engagements are at a thousand yards. Um, is it is there too much data with too many variables and inputs? I have no idea. Um, the other problem as well on that, which is worth bearing in mind, is the the vehicles will be vehicles you think are dead may not be dead and they can also be rec recovered and patched up um there may and also i'm skeptical of a lot of operational research studies from the campaign for various reasons um some people say they're infallible there was some political elements about air power and certain people being very keen proponents to describe things to air, air attack and stuff um but yeah no that's a good question but, but the, the data may not even exist. Um, simple yeah. one from Kevin Jones there. Did the British and American army use the same radio frequencies when in dual action? I have no idea. 
Uh, I can't think of many because they don't. They then don't tend to get. I can't that think of many occasions where it ever came up in Normandy. Uh the only actually when five three Reke link up with the Americans, they know the Americans are coming through. Uh, and actually, when they close the Falaise Gap, there's lots of there's lots of careful communication. I think with flares and stuff because it's it's very hard because you've got yes it, yes with blue coat and stuff you've got formation side by side and you can have liaison officers who are just talking to each other because you need these personal relationships and 21st army group is a very the british and canadians so it's, it's they're trying to really integrate down they have all monty is his liaison officers and things and they want to be communicative and uh, spread that shared data let's use the modern term um when it comes towards closing the fellows gap you these systems aren't really in place because everyone's using different kit different frequencies and stuff but they are warned because they do get the maps and stuff and th the way it does close is a bit clunky and things um but yeah then then I, I can't believe they're operating the same frequencies because it requires coordination and assets which are miles could be 30 40 50 60 yeah, 70 miles apart uh, yeah. Makes it's huge me. distances yeah huge distances and philip blood um the amazing uh, dr philip blood of of world war ii tv fame himself um can jonathan Ware make comments about the armored troops morale in the campaign oh cool uh yeah sure um gonna have to think about that for a second 153 Royal Armour Corps massively takes a punch off. Actually, 34 Tank Brigade definitely lose some faith in their, their Churchills, but they're not seeing the other side of the data. Um, there's clearly an attitude. The Tiger Tank is the only thing able to hold Hill 112, and the Tiger Tank cruise morale remains pretty buoyant, apart from the situation they're in. Um, other tank crews, there's, there's the whole jokes between Panzer IV crews and Panther crews about being uh, thin-skinned. Um, but units tend to bounce back, and... No, I'd, I'd probably say units tend to bounce back. The casualty rates when vehicles are lost aren't always that awful, but the psychiat we don't always have the psychiatric casualty data on how many uh, men are returning to action. Um, they can tend to get back into action relatively fast as well. So I, I, that's a that's a that's a that's going to have me thinking actually for once. I actually was having me thinking. Yeah, yeah, and and again with the fact that there's there's more to be talking about in terms of combined arms. And again, we talked about this with that with Daniel Bolden. It came up with Pritt, I think, last night. Is historians tend because we're all, all human beings be good on one subject. So you have your people who are good on infantry or armor or air power or artillery. And, you know, I've got some great books on my shelves that are artillery focused, great books that are armor focused. It's bringing them all together. And you have to juggle a lot of balls to do that. And you have to spend a lot of time reading things. And, you know, it's 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 hard. Doing good history is hard, folks. <laughs> it's that's the bottom. Those who are watching this or are writing books, Andy Chatterton, Brad, who does his on this day in Canadian Literary History Channel, people who are making, creating, doing history. It's hard. For, it really isn't easy uh, doing poor history. It's quite easy, but doing decent history is hard, and and it doesn't make you any money, and it takes a long time, and yeah. Um, any other questions, folks? Then we'll I'll bring things to an end now. Um, was there a central command for this entire area? Was it up to each nationality to do so? I mean, Twenty First Army Group does cover everything in terms of ground operations, but you know, it's it's even we, we talked about this week. Armoured divisions within the same nation don't operate the same way. So trying to get everybody to sing the same hymn sheet, whatever you want, it's just no, no is the simple answer. Well, yeah, it's a bit like um, Patton's jibe about driving the Brits into the sea in regards to Falaise. I always find interesting because the context of that is pretty much him uh, doing a, a Eisenhower and Bradley because um, he disagrees with their plan. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean the Brits are Brits are doing their thing, Canadians are doing their thing, uh under Monty's uh guidance as are the Americans. And you see you see the Americans get, you know, more independent as the campaign goes on. And you see Patton, I mean Patton wants to do Patton actually is lining more more in line with what Montgomery wants than Eisenhower, especially when he tries to tries to start wrapping around on things. He disagrees with Ike completely. And we don't talk about that because we we there's certain views of the campaign. Um, to say that Patton and Monty are agreeing on something, oh my word! But that's uh, that's seventy years of sort of mean story dominating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, and uh, and on a weird combined point, I mean arms point, Eleventh Armored Division are basically leading their advance with a D seven dozer, pretty much. So to shunt through roadblocks because the roadblocks are the key problem they're encountering. And we don't bulldozer are integral to this, and armored bulldozers crop up the whole time. And you have units racing around and stealing theirs, but unless you dig into the ordnance files, you don't find that story out. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, that was a complete weird... And another there. point, which I'm going to expand on from Sean McCracken again, saying, does the Navy have any effect on operations beyond their fire support? But I'm going to spin that round the fact that there's another aspect that we don't talk about enough, and the fact that the 
the limitations of the the Allied beachhead not moving inland supposedly fast enough does allow the beachhead to stay within the range of the naval guns for for longer than perhaps we'd anticipated, and that's another aspect we talk about. We we don't always talk about the the, the need of the the use of air support. We definitely don't talk enough about the the, the naval support. We talk about it on D Day, and then and Stephen Fish would probably argue we get most of that wrong, but we certainly don't talk about the role of the navy in terms of providing that gunnery in the days that days that follow. Is that is that something you think is an area? we are undervaluing and appreciating john the germans talk about it quite a lot in areas when naval gunfire can't get inland i'm just going to throw that out there the germans talk about naval gunfire where it's not affecting them inland uh quite a bit um yeah no it, it depends actually i think there's a lot of really 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 good stuff to be done for naval researchers i think fisher and hewitt are going to get nick hewitt and uh, Stephen fisher are going to do this though I'm yeah. sort of challenging this. Um, there, there is a lot of really good work to be done in tracing uh, fire missions from ships to target because you can actually do that because th because there's not so many rounds fired by the larger vessels. Um, so yeah, and I think also some of the time that when we're talking about uh, naval gunfire, we're actually talking about super uh, about heavy artillery. Um, I don't think any of mm. our super heavy batteries are Normandy. I'd have to actually check that. Annoyingly, um, it's a bit like the American one five five millimeter SPs get described as giant, you know, giant ridiculous contraptions which get spied by the Germans when they're in the British sector and cause a quite a quite a big panic actually. Um uh, just as Churchill's become black dogs. Flame black like dogs. But um, yeah no that's that is that is a that is a, that is a good question. The, it, the great it hasn't been tied together. It hasn't been tied no, together. Who who is another frequent frequent flyer with World War Two TV? How were bomb lines established to ensure that Allied airport power did not engage friendly tanks? Ah oh, so carefully but there's some weird stuff um when the canadians get bombed it's totalized or tractable there's some weird bits that crop up about uh i think it's dempsey takes to his plane and fires flares to tell the germans not to uh, tell the brits not to bomb x and y we have exclusion zones and the germans know we'll pull troops back and things as we do you know we do pull troops back the americans do the same thing where you you want this area where you're not going to blow it to smithereens because you don't want to lose all your, all your own troops uh with missed drops and stuff but there are some of the stuff which do tie in with the wrong flares being used for different colors so the iff ones being taken as target ones due to miscoms very, i mean very very simple human error uh about systems not quite interacting uh, which is quite interesting. And again, I mean, um, a lot of the assets we want to talk to are based in Britain, and you can't just pick up a let's go to the earlier meme, you can't just pick up a phone and, and talk to them. It's, it's all a lot more involved than all of this, you know? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think we'll kind of probably round things to, to, um, to, to round things up now. Um, and yeah, I've, there's a chat because we had a, we had a, a, a troll kind of joining in the conversation earlier who was just, Going on about the Eastern Front, but he didn't want to engage and started being insulting to people on the on the thread. So um, I, I I've got rid of him. So um, anyway, um, this has been a great chat. We've enjoyed having it there, and we will have you back, and we can do something specific because with the Ardennes show was a bit more um confined. Uh, less this was good. It was good being unruly. It was more. I, d I didn't more, expect this. More I, riffing today. It was. It was. I was meant to be structured, like really structured. That was my plan today. It was really structured on paper. Um, but yeah, I mean, the problem was I got sucked in. Like, I got sucked back in because it's a huge topic. I went, I, I skimmed 450,000 words of prose to, to do this. Um, and all the stuff which didn't make the cut as well, I had to glance at. Um, but yeah, because it's it's such a huge topic. And this is why Bovington, do an armor day, get several panels on, several talks, different people doing the commentary on the vehicles. And there, there's enough specialists in the UK who are charismatic and can deliver that and talk to an audience because it would it would definitely sell out because no one's doing it. Yeah, no, definitely. Just saying, just saying. Well, well, I'll just remind you what we've got coming up and I'll come back and say goodbye. So, show, folks, it's two shows tomorrow. First one, 10 a.m. UK time GMT. We're going over with an Australian guest to talk about Stuart tanks over in that part of the world. So that'd be fantastic because we, for those who love the Stuart, we're going to be talking about them engaged with Australian troops against the Japanese. And then later on, uh, 7 p.m. UK time GMT, we have um, Nicholas Moran, chieftain on YouTube, is coming on to give us the benefit of his experience. And he is a or was a is a serving tanker about tank destroyer units in North Africa and Tunisia. So that'd be fantastic. And that will, in fact, round out 
Armoured Actions Week. And then next week, we start off with lots of other things. So um, right now, I'm going to just say, as usual, folks, thank you for your support. Thank you for enjoying uh, enjoying the sidebar conversations. I've only had to block about two or three people, but he was starting to be insulting. So he's gone. That's it. Well, we won't talk about it anymore. It's not that we don't want to engage. It's just that he started getting insulting towards other users, and that I don't tolerate. So please support what we're doing on Twitter, social media, share what we're doing, and consider becoming a member and a patron. So there we go. So, um, John, thanks very much for joining us. And thanks for having me. We will see you all again sometime. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying um, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Bye.